Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning into part six of episode 300 of Last Born in the Wilderness. I'm your host, Patrick Farnsworth. This one in particular, and I would say the next part as well, the very last part of this series, are very close to my heart. Issues that deal with trauma, intergenerational trauma, psychology, cultural somas, animism, spirituality, masculinity, gender, a lot of these subjects that I think if we're going to approach the subject of how to proceed in this time, uh, there is a lot of things that need to be addressed that are not strictly material, or they are material in a certain way, but they affect us on a really deep, emotional, psychosocial way. And I think that it's really important that we unravel the threads of this a little bit to maybe follow the threads and figure out where they lead as far as why we have arrived at the moment that we have in the global crises that we are in the midst of. For me, when I started doing this podcast, I began to explore climate disruption, environmental degradation, the biospheric collapse that we are currently experiencing, that we are within, having an anti-capitalist approach to a lot of the subjects that I have attempted to discuss on this podcast and interview people about. All of those are important and good, and they will be on some level uh, addressed in this part as well, but I personally have struggled a lot with depression. I personally have struggled a lot with anxiety. I've had a lot of deep questions around the effects of colonialism and capitalism on our psychology, on how we develop as cultural beings. While I've explored that on an abstract level for several years now at this point, Inevitably, it's not enough to talk about it on that level. You have to apply that to yourself. So in many ways, I've used this podcast as a platform for me to reach out to people that I have a lot of respect for in regards to these subjects that have done incredible work trying to unpack all of these subjects and figure out you know, what the hell is going on, so to speak. And in turn, that has affected me personally. I just want to be clear that I've carried a lot of baggage with me throughout my life, and I think we all do. I've carried them into my relationships. I've carried them into my work. I've carried a lot of biases, privilege, and entitlement, and I have tried to examine that. And I think doing the interviews that I've done over the years has allowed me to talk with people that have done their own work trying to explore these subjects, try to unpack a lot of these things within them. And I think by exposing myself in that way and talking about the subjects that I've chosen to talk about over the years, uh, I personally have felt like I've changed, that I've grown in some way, and that I know that I have a lot more growth left and that that is the continual process of life. And especially as we meet the moment that we're in where there is a great deal of uncertainty about how long all of this is going to hold together in some way or another, I still think that asking these deep, fundamental spiritual questions are of utmost importance because we cannot address the grief, the despair, the anger that is inevitably going to come up without examining some of the root causes of the issues that we have been presented with in our time. And I have tried through the previous sections, and this one as well, to weave together these subjects, weave together all these various trends these various insights that I've had and that others have had over the years and try to create something of a cartography of where we are and how we got here. There's always more to learn. There's always going to be blind spots that I will have, that others will have. But inevitably, I think what I've attempted to do has been to shine a light on the parts of ourselves that we may feel a little uncomfortable looking at. I know that I have felt deeply uncomfortable looking at certain parts of myself and why I am the way I am, why I have behaved the way that I have in certain contexts under certain conditions. And I think, again, if we're going to truly address the moment that we're in, we're going to have to really look at ourselves and figure out how the hell we got here in the first place. Because that's the only way that we can heal. That's the only way that we can integrate these things, make sense of them and move forward in whatever way that means for you. So I think when I was organizing this part, putting all the different sections of these episodes together, I 
had a little bit of a difficult time figuring out where each piece would go. I've had this issue with each part because it's hard to figure out how to flow each of these subjects together that each of the interviewees speak about. But I think I've found a good flow for this one. And the first part that I would like to feature to discuss these things is with Dr. Rayanne Eisler. This interview was done in collaboration with Colibri Ter Sonnenblum, who is somebody that I've also interviewed on the podcast. He is the host of the Voices for Nature and Peace podcast, and this interview was released on his podcast as well as mine. But Dr. Ryan Eisler is a social system scientist, cultural historian, and attorney. She's the author of many different books, and most famously the author of The Chalice and the Blade, Our History, Our Future. And as of the recording of this interview, she had just released a book that she had co-authored with Douglas Fry titled Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Future. What I wrote for this episode was Partnership and Domination, Paradigms That Stand at Either End, of what humanity has been capable of producing in societies and cultures throughout human history. Dr. Eisler's decades of groundbreaking research into the roots of each of these paradigms has lifted the veil of what human beings are truly capable of, expanding our view of what human nature really is by drawing on numerous sources of research from anthropology, archaeology, psychology, and more. As she elaborates in this interview, dominator societies are trauma factories that reproduce trauma intergenerationally, and that these dynamics play out within the bounds of the left versus right sociopolitical paradigm we operate within. To truly allow a partnership paradigm to gain prominence again, we must address the root causes that allow dominator systems to maintain their hold, which includes examining the relationship between genders as well as the earliest stages of childhood development. Now, we're going to talk about childhood development in the next section right after this, But Dr. Eisler begins by talking about human nature, about how it's actually not really a thing. Human nature is very much contextual. It's based on a lot of different factors. And I think that this is really important to note because throughout human history, we've had numerous kinds of societies. We have had numerous cultural forms that human beings have existed under and within. And understanding that, it allows us to step outside of the paradigm that we are in. Do you feel it's frustrating because when you talk about this, it, it's something that I, I've tried to explore in my own way, which is the big question around what human nature is. Uh, I find it such a big thing and so complex of a thing that it really to try to say that we're naturally warlike or we're naturally this or that. You know, people will often project what they see around them onto others and onto the past. And do you get a sense that that whole question is tainted? by that, uh, by the kind of conditioned understandings that we have about what human nature is, that maybe we just have never seen what it's actually like to live in a partnership society. So we just imagine that those are myths or stories that are told. Um, Do you have, I guess, maybe more concrete examples of what a partnership society would look like, not only in the past, but also in the present? Well, let me first address the question that you bring up, uh, the story that we've been told about human nature, which, whether it's original sin, whether it's selfish genes, is the same story. Uh, We're bad, that's human nature, and therefore we have to be rigidly controlled from the top, right? Whether by God or by his so-called representatives here on earth or some dictator, some strong man, etc. Uh, and that is a very convenient story to impose and maintain domination systems. Now, my most recent book, uh, Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, which came out with Oxford University Press last year, uh, really addresses that question, among others, uh, and shows that, for one thing, uh, we're asking the wrong question. Uh, Human nature is not fixed. Um, We have the capacity for caring, for consciousness, for creativity, but we also have, obviously, capacities for insensitivity, cruelty, destructiveness, violence. The 
what we know today from neuroscience. And the academy is being very, very, very slow in incorporating this knowledge. And it, the academy is so siloed, the universities are so siloed, so fragmented that it, well, maybe you have this information in a course on neuroscience or an occasional course on psychology, whereas it should be part of sociology, it should be part of political science, of economics, because what we today know is that this question of nature versus nurture is a really nonsensical question, because what we know from neuroscience is that nothing less than how our brains develop, how our brains develop, uh, is a function of the interaction of genes with our environment, especially during our first years of life, when we are even more malleable and more flexible. Um, these are the years when we know from the years from zero to three, 85% of brain structures are formed. So, and uh, what my work shows uh, is that neuroscience today supports the conclusion that how our brains, and hence how we feel, how we think, how we act, including how we vote and work and everything else, uh, that these are very different depending on the degree to which our cultural environments orient to the partnership or domination side of the scale. Uh, in other words, as mediated, of course, by families, by education, by religion, politics, economics, and so forth. So that is really changing our story and nurturing our humanity and all my books uh, starting with the chalice and the blade, which now, by the way, is in um, what is it, fifty-seven U.S. printings and twenty-seven foreign editions. They tell a different story, a more accurate and realistic and inclusive story of our human adventure here on Earth. Okay, so this is fascinating to me. Um, this idea of saying, okay. Human nature is not fixed. So, in other words, the discussion of are we, um, by nature, dominating or focused on partnership is the wrong question. You're saying we have the capacities for both, and that then our individual capacities are brought out depending on what culture that we're born into, and then most of that is set at an early age. So... Uh, from that standpoint, then, um, as individuals, we need to understand how that process happened to ourself, I suppose, in order to break out of things that we need to break out of. Absolutely. And the good news is that actually, if you want to really look at what we're so called wired for, uh, we humans uh, are in some very real uh, sense, uh, physiologically, biologically, wired more for partnership rather than domination relations. However, uh, domination systems suppress those capacities. Uh, for example, I, I'll just give you one example uh, of, of a study that is uh, discussed in uh, Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, we receive neurochemical rewards of pleasure, not only when we are cared for, but when we care for others, uh, whether it's a mate or a friend or a child, even a pet, right? We feel good. Uh, however, um, domination systems reward, reward, uh, and really make it seem normal, um, as we see in, in some U.S. subcultures, uh, to think only in terms of in-group versus out-group terms. 
uh, so that you may be kind to the people in your in-group, but the out-group, um, the other, is labeled as not only inferior, but dangerous. And this starts, and this is why I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the partnership domination scale does not marginalize the majority of humanity, women and children. It starts really with the model that we internalize uh, for gender. That's right because we're so used to thinking of gender as, quote, just a women's issue, right? Which is kind of idiotic because women are half of humanity, more or less, uh, you know, I mean, making allowance for sexual orientations and whatever. Uh, but uh, what, what, what we miss here is that we humans really uh, have an enormous capacity uh, for caring, but when you are brought up with this model of our species where the difference in form between male and female is equated with either superiority or inferiority, with dominating or being dominated, with being served or serving, uh, children internalize a template for equating difference, whether it is based on race whether it's based on religion, whether it's based on sexual orientation, with, uh, yeah, with superior, inferior. Uh, and, and we have really internalized this to varying degrees, but it is particularly strong in cultures that orient to the domination side, as I said, whether they're Eastern or Western, Northern or Southern, religious or secular, a rightist or leftist. I mean, Stalin, for example, uh, when he came into power, he reversed what little had been done under Lenin uh, to equalize relations in families. Uh, you know, you, uh, you, abortion again became a very, you know, heinous crime, right? Uh, illegitimacy. I mean, all of a sudden, some children were considered illegitimate. How can a child be illegitimate? But a child's a child, right? But he wanted a return, as do the people pushing us back to the so-called traditional, which is a code for an authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, uh, highly punitive family. And the good news, however, is that even some people who are brought up in these families, if they just glimpse that there is another possibility, they reject that. That's the good news. The bad news is that a majority of people who are brought up in rigid domination families are very likely to uh, really even vote for strongman leaders. I really wanted to include Dr. Eisler's section there at the very beginning because I think that that's a very good place to begin this part, to begin at that point of understanding through Dr. Eisler's decades-long research into what a partnership and domination cultural lens looks like, how human nature itself is not this fixed thing by any stretch. It is something that is very malleable. It is something that is always changing and adapting to the circumstances and that we as human beings have some agency in choosing what we would define as our nature that through the very complex interplay of genetics, our environment, of the cultural context in which we operate under, all of these factors play into who you are as a human being. You are not an island. You are deeply connected to your ancestors. You are deeply connected to your peers, to the cultures in which you are raised up within. Whether you love that idea or not, it's just the way it is, and you have to make sense of that. There has been a subject that I have been deeply invested in understanding for some time because I think I needed to understand it on a personal level, but I also wanted to understand why people are the way they are. Why are we the way we are? Why do we react to certain situations the way that we do? 
Where does trauma come from? How deep does that run? Can we even call everything that we've experienced as children trauma? Is there another category or definition to describe what we may define as difficult or adverse experiences? The fact is, is that so much of what we're going to be going through here in this section really has to do with childhood trauma, has to do with developmental psychology. It has to do with the fact that the way in which we raise our children affects the ways in which their personalities develop, the ways in which their minds develop, the ways in which their relationships to their bodies and to others develops. And that that is passed down intergenerationally. And that that interplays with your genetics, that interplays with the cultures in which we're a part of. All of this is deeply connected. And so when I ask the question, why do we have these global crises, right? Why do we have a system that is so obviously destructive? Is that human nature that we are doing what we're doing? It is, but only in the sense that it is just as much a part of our nature to live in community and relationship with one another in which we actually serve the earth and we actually serve our fellow living beings on this planet. That is just as much a part of human nature as anything else. So why are we the way we are? Why is this the condition in which we live under? And honestly, so much of it comes down to, what was your childhood like? How were you raised? There's a lot of really good scientific research that has been done to show what does and doesn't work as far as helping a child develop their social skills, their social abilities, their connection again to their bodies, to themselves, uh, their emotional intelligence, their ability to be empathetic. And it is extremely crucial that we understand this if we are to make any sense of how we got to where we are and how we undo some of these patterns of intergenerational trauma. Now, Darsha Narvais is a professor of psychology at Notre Dame University. She is the author and editor of numerous books, including Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom, and Indigenous Sustainable Wisdom, First Nation Know-How for Global Flourishing. And she has written regularly, extensively, on parenting, child development, self-development, and morality. Now, the first time that I spoke with Darsha was over three years ago at this point, uh, back when I was first beginning to do interviews for the podcast. Of course, a great deal has changed and happened since I started recording interviews, uh, not just with my work specifically, but in the world at large. And so in contemplating the roots of the fragmented, disruptive responses the novel coronavirus pandemic had generated, has generated, at that time, I felt compelled to reconnect with Professor Narvais to discuss her insights into this subject. This includes an examination of the contemporary common child-rearing practices in the West, specifically the United States, and how this informs the ideologies and belief systems people attach themselves to in states of crisis and uncertainty, such as ours. And now, I just want to quote something here. This is on her website, and it's an explanation of what the evolved nest is. Every animal has a nest for its young that forms part of an extra genetic inheritance corresponding to the needs and maturation pace of offspring. Humans evolved to have the most helpless newborns in the most intensive caregiving niche. Child-rearing practices consistent with the human nest were practiced for over 99% of human genus existence and are still in some indigenous cultures. Intensive caregiving in early life includes nearly constant touch, extensive breastfeeding, and free play with multi-age peers, as well as positive social support for the mother, child, dyad, and multiple adult caregivers. All these caregiving practices are correlated with physical and mental health outcomes, but also with social and moral development. You know, I've just started doing some therapy very recently, and um, I'm, I'm excited and also a little afraid, honestly, because it's, it does it is exactly what you say, you know, once you get to the root of that pain or that trauma, um, you don't really know what's on the other side of that. And for some reason, we fear, or I fear, and I think others do as well, um, what is on the other side of that trauma? Because I think it, it I, I guess you, you mentioned something here about the ideology, uh, ideology and black and white thinking. And something that came up in that when you said that was I was thinking is like, in the in a liberal democracy that we supposedly have, um, 
there's this 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 notion that everybody is entitled to their opinions as long as it doesn't hurt other people or or anything like that. But even that is, you know, th- there's certainly a um, space that's given to ideologies that actually do encourage the harming of people, even if people don't really want to come to terms with that. But I'm curious about that because I think we have this idea in our society that people can have their opinions on the right or on the left. They can have whatever ideological position they want. Uh, But I I feel like the ideologies that we attach ourselves to speak to something far deeper than just this notion of the freedom of ideas. Uh, Some ideologies are are truly toxic and based in a certain way of thinking or being that um, is uh, harmful. And I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on why certain people attach themselves to certain ideologies and how that justifies their, their pain or their trauma. Yeah. So I talk about the brain's development and in early life, if you are overly stressed, you tend to then enhance your survival systems, your, your systems that keep you alive, which include the stress response and also the emotion systems of fear and anger and uh, panic and when you're, um, instead of growing, what you're supposed to be growing is all these social capacities and attunement and engagement with others. That's what's supposed to grow all sorts of nonverbal uh, understanding and skills in before language starts. You're supposed to be developing that. But if you've been stressed as a baby, as I've mentioned, uh, you're not going to grow those. You're going to enhance these survival systems and then you're not going to grow the capacities, the executive functions that control them, which with okay. a good childhood, you are able to realize, you know, that maybe there's a shadow that comes across the room and your, your uh, subconscious thinks it's some monster coming after you. And then you, you look at it and you realize, oh, no, it's just a shadow. Well, with a good, well-functioning brain, you're able to then calm yourself down, calm yourself down right away. And, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. But for a poorly functioning brain, it, this panic reverberates and reverberates and you can't get yourself back calmed down. And then everything, you start to be threat reactive with a, a poorly functioning um, brain and you see threats everywhere. And so you're always in this state of panic. And so you look for something to calm yourself down. And it's out there because you don't have it inside because it wasn't developed well. And so you, uh, you latch on to something and, and, um, or your parents tell you to do this or they spank you into not paying attention to your own emotions and your own spirit, your own interests. And you then start to real think that your, um, how to be a person is to be better than that group. And you just develop, it's like, uh, when I was a kid, the male ego was a big thing people would talk about, you know, and there'd be guys you'd meet. And then you meet that you, know, you had to be careful how you talk to them because they had this chip on their shoulder that they're better than women, you know, and, and so you, <laughs> you knew that. And uh, that's a sign of fragility that that person is not flexible, not attuned. They treat you like a, you're a stereotype um, because that's their brain isn't fully developed. So it's a lot of right hemisphere stuff that's supposed to develop in early life that doesn't develop. And that that's what gives you the flexibility to be tuned into others. And so you end up then instead with a kind of a scripted, stereotypic kind of life. Uh, You use scripts when you go into a situation. Those people are, uh, this is my group, that's your group, you're evil, bad, whatever, or you stay in your place and then we'll all be fine, whatever it is. And if things go awry from your script, you get all upset and then you have to do something you're usually, um, for men, it's externalizing, they call it in psychology, which is aggression. You aggress towards the other, uh, like the recent um, killing of the black man who was jogging down the street. He was somehow, um, uh, you know, not staying in his place as a black man for the two white fellows who killed him. Uh, and that's what would happen with women and men in my growing up years, uh, you didn't see it so much uh, anyway, but that's what happens, right? You, someone's violating your script and you blame them for it instead of realizing you have a very narrow script and you're very stress reactive and there's some healing that has to be done, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that speaks to uh, the shifting baselines, as you've discussed, where 
Well, I'll, actually, I would just ask that you could please explain that concept a bit because uh, it applies sure. to, to multiple fields of research and sciences and whatnot. But I guess maybe uh, discuss the general concept and how it applies to what you're discussing. Yeah, so baseline is uh, some form of what you think is normal, uh, and you can make comparisons to what you think is normal. And I, my complaints in psychology is they use baselines of what they think is normal psychology or normal human behavior or human nature from this narrow slice of people in the Western world, most of whom are unnested. So they, their brains are not fully developed as a human being. And yet they they just assume the people coming into the lab are the ones that are their normal. And then, oh, look, they scored this way. And so humans are always this way. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's happened, <laughs> what's happened is uh, there's just been this over time uh, a, a shift in baselines about what is normal, a uh, normal way to raise a child. Uh, and so, like I said before, leaving them alone in their own room, in their own crib, a baby, uh, letting them cry themselves to sleep, giving them formula, fake food, uh, and um, telling them you love them while you leave them alone gets them all confused because the world is alive and you've broken the continuum of feeling safe in the world. And now they have to somehow regroup so they develop some kind of psychopathology to survive. <clears throat> so that's the baseline then, the shift away from nurturing child raising. And we have 99% of our history was in foraging nomadic bands who provide the nest, what I call the evolved nest, breastfeeding and uh, touch 24-7, carrying all the time with a baby and uh, play and multiple adult caregivers, so it's not just mom or mom and dad. And just this whole uh, sense of community, constant communal connection, and it builds a great brain, a very intelligent, social, emotional, intelligent uh, uh, way of uh, being with others. And so uh, the baseline shifted away from that to this kind of un what I call undercare. It's really neglect, but that's a legal term. So I say undercare. And then that, that yields uh, kids that are kind of dysregulated and self-centered and aggressive, aggressive, you know, and we start to think that's normal. Of course, then we give them pills. So they just sit there, sit there dully and listen to sit in school, you know, the one of the, at least the old definition of ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in the manual uh, for psychiatrists and psychologists said uh, one of the definitions was, will not sit still for boring tasks. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what is that for? That's the adult. <laughs> forgotten what it means to be a child to be a child is to play all the time social play that's how you build your brain and the kids know that so we force them to sit still so that's another uh, slipped baseline so we think they're supposed to be aggressive and all and you have to punish them into being good well that's not the way it works in our ancestral context that's crazy and then you end up with adults who are depressed and anxious and lonely and unskilled and rigid and stiff-minded and stress-reactive. And we think that's normal now. Oh, human nature is selfish and aggressive. That's just the way. Yeah, but that's because we've been misraising people for generations now. That's not normal for our species. We haven't given them the species-typical nest. And then you end up, adults, build a culture that perpetuates the cycle, whatever it is, right? So uh, in the animal studies, the parents who are poor uh, nurturers, usually it's the mothers uh, that are studied, and their daughters are worse. And so we end up with this getting, the cycle's going down right now. And part of, part of the reason for uh, our uh, forgetfulness is that we've, we're a nation of immigrants, the United States, and they People came over without their extended families who knew how to raise babies. And there you are as a young couple and you don't know what to do. You both have to work. And so you start feeding your baby oatmeal and stuff and you kill it. <coughs> and this is the start of the American Academy of Pediatrics was all these mothers were killing their babies by feeding them non-breast milk because they had to go to work. So they started for, uh, formulas and things. Okay. Wow. Uh, so... I guess that that is kind of the root of it then, is, as you discussed with the fact that most Americans are, are um, disconnected from their heritage in some form, or 
there is maybe a you know we're, we see this as a as a, a thing to be proud of which is that we're a nation of immigrants um that this nation was built with people from all over the world that came to this land as a sort of a promise, right? Uh, a, a place that people could come and there would be freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and all these different things granted to people. Of course, we know that that's really unequally distributed even to the present. Um, but to me, it's like, it, it, I've been thinking a lot about, and something I've explored on the podcast as well is, you know, I think that that people think that people came here because they they just had this sort of deep idealism, this sense that, you know, we're going to live in a land that's freer and better. Um, I, I think that there's a big part of that that's ignored, which is what I'm speaking as somebody who's a um, descendant of uh, Europeans. And I, I have this strong feeling that in my, my ancestors and the ancestors of so many people that live on this land, we're escaping some very difficult and traumatic circumstances in Europe. And they carried those with them and re and like you talk about shifting baselines, it's like they reinforced some of those traumas on the peoples that lived here and displaced them and murdered them. And that that is actually a part of the way that they were dealing with their trauma. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that, about how, you know, this intergenerational trauma, the shifting baseline has been in effect for, a very long time and that we're still sort of playing out those traumas to the present. Yeah. One of the reasons uh, a lot of Europeans came over here it coincided with the takeover of the common lands in Europe uh, okay. happened over a few hundred years, starting in England, primarily where the aristocracy, the wealthy would just, just take over the forests where everybody had been getting their uh, hunting and gathering and things. And they just took them over and, they did that over here, too, uh, in Appalachia. People would uh, – a strange notion of property, which is not very old, just a few hundred years old. Um, people would buy some land, like in Appalachia, and they, they wouldn't go there. they just have the hold the property title. And so people would um, <clears throat> squat – I guess squatters would be there, and they'd just live there in their own uh, homes and use the forest for – uh, food. Um, and then the property owners came in. There, there's a good book call, um, called Ramp Hollow about this, where the property owners came in and wanted the people to work in their factory or their industry, whatever it was. And so they cut down the forest completely. And so people didn't have anywhere to get food anymore. And so they had to go wage, be wage laborers, you know, and that's just what's mm. happened over the last few hundred years with capitalism and um, the imposition of working for others on people. Um, but I think it goes back to civilization <clears throat> around 10,000 years ago, depending on where you're looking and um, where people got afraid. That it, before that time, everyone would rely on nature to provide food and, and uh, water and everything you needed. And something happened. Um, people can't Aren't, aren't sure what happened exactly. Was it that there was too many people and they had to start to cultivate plants uh, or um, domesticate animals? Or It's unclear exactly, but the shift happened around the world, not uh, with in small communities. Most people still were hunter-gatherers for a long time and still. Now there are a lot of groups. Um, but there was something about uh, enslaving, uh, to put it, harshly enslaving plants and animals so they enslave the weeds that would grow in disturbed soil so that's wheat barley corn right those um kinds of grains will grow in disturbed soil most plants won't uh and then the animals um they domesticated not all animals can be domesticated just a few and that middle eastern the uh, <laughs> um Tigris Euphrates area, right? The Crescent uh, was the place that these things supposedly in part, well, at least that's one story, they came from that. And so that they also then adopted the ideologies of uh, things that were the, the thunder god, right? The um, sky god uh, being apart from the world. Whereas before that, 
God, everything was sacred. Everything uh, was part of, you know, being the continuum of life. And so there's a lot of different pieces that, that fall in, uh, that contribute to this current uh, crises we're in, not only the pandemic, but ecologically. We're about ready to go over the cliff. All sorts of tipping points are about to take place, and um, the climate of the globe will get out of whack extremely. So, um, but that that's all, all those little pieces are uh, contributing factors. Okay. Yeah, I feel like there there's definitely a lot of uh, pieces to this. And so to just sort of narrow it down to one thing, of course, is not necessarily giving it justice. But I do think that it's, it's interesting because I, I remember um, it was maybe a year or so ago. He was a former co- co-worker of mine and he and his uh, partner just had a child and he was on social media and he was, um, in a sense, he was bragging uh, about how he raises his child, which is, you know, when when his child is uh, misbehaving or as, as they perceive it as misbehaving, uh, they they spank their child, right? I And this is a baby. Yeah, this was a, I, I think that they may have been a toddler at this point, but it wouldn't be that hard to imagine they did something similar to that even younger. Um, and... Of course, it really irritated me. It really bothered me a great deal. So I responded to it and it was amazing. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I had a whole other group of people start responding to me and saying that I was the ridiculous one for saying that spanking is actually hitting and it's abusive and it it messes up the development of the child. And because they themselves will defend their own uh, childhood experiences of being disciplined in that way, as they call it, being disciplined. Um and I find that really, it, it's disheartening in a certain way because I think people identify with their trauma. Um, yeah. And when I think about, for instance, the genocide of indigenous peoples, the enslavement of African populations that, that built this country, essentially, and I think about all the violence that had to be enacted in order to build this American project, and I think about all the individual smaller scale level, you know, when we think about the individual and how everybody is, they create narratives and stories and ideologies and, and mythologies in order to almost give, um, a positive spin on their trauma that they either inflicted on others or that they themselves experienced. And, and Mm -hmm. I know that I went from like the macro to the micro there, but basically I see it in both of those ways all the time. I'm always thinking about what's happening on a larger scale and how that's reflective of what's happening on the individual scale as well. So with this this coworker of mine defending uh, his child-rearing practices, his major defense was, and the defense of so many other people was, well, I was hit as a, or I was spanked as a child. <laughs> and, and I'm fine. And I'm fine, <laughs> right? And that to me is like, you're not fine. <laughs> I promise you, if you weren't fine, you probably wouldn't be defending that. You would be addressing it in a healthy way. Um, but I couldn't get through to them. I really couldn't. There was nothing I could say or do. I could pre- present them with as, as much scientific information, as many of the research that you've done. I even shared, I tried to share some some stuff that we spoke about on the podcast the last time we spoke. Um because I think your work is very approachable. It's not too technical. You explain everything very well. Uh, But it was, again, I guess I'm just pointing to the disheartening nature of human beings and the way we develop, where we actually uphold our trauma as a sort of achievement or a virtue or something to be proud of. And that disturbs me, and it makes me feel a bit pessimistic, honestly, about the, the direction that we're going in collectively right now. And I was curious what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, uh, I've had the same experiences. Yeah, people say, "Oh, well, that's silly. Be nice to your baby. What? Mm. They're going to control you. You can spoil the baby," which is craziness. That's it, it, in a way they're advocating uh, when they say that uh, parent independence. The baby mm. is supposed to be dependent on you for learning how to self-regulate all the systems of physiological and psychological systems. And if you force them to be alone, they're going to then not be very regulated. But, yeah, you get to have your life back. Parents have been told, so they write to me and they say, well, they told me I should sleep train so I can get my life back. Because <laughs> <laughs> all these other people, for some reason, think that, you know, having a baby is a pain in the neck rather than the joy of your life, you know. So there's this, uh, the caregiving 
uh, attachment, there's a <clears throat> two kinds of attachment. One is the child's attachment that can develop, uh, and it's a neurobiological thing, but the people measure it uh, more like uh, in situations. And attachment can be secure or all sorts of different kinds of insecure. But there's also the caregiver attachment system. And a lot of that's broken, I think. We break it when we uh, <clears throat> impose medicalized birth on moms uh, and babies. Uh, a lot of them are unnecessary. Uh, some are necessary. but uh, And so it, when you interfere with that post-birth, when you interfere with all the chemicals that are happening in a natural birth, like inducing labor, that interferes, that's oxytocin, interferes with the normal development of oxytocin in mom and baby. And then if you uh, keep them separate in that magic hour, the golden hour after birth, then you, you're missing that their bodies are ready to glom onto each other, magnetized, you know, it's so amazing mm. that you've just messed that up. Well, then they, you know, they never quite get coordinated again in many cases. And so uh, a lot of that's happening. And I think what then people have to do is they have to adopt this toughness, grit, you know, <laughs> attitude toward life and their kids and you know and i make you strong by spanking you it's for your own good <laughs> <laughs> crazy stuff right but you have to develop a story to explain yourself why are you always so reactive and why do you hate that or this or that and you make up a story and people tell you the story to adopt and so that's i grew up in a fundamentalist christian home and that's the stories those people aren't going to be in heaven we are though you know and you worms you god has been nice to you and so you're gonna get to heaven but you have to be good and all, all these crazy things uh, because people don't have it inside so when you raise a child to have their spirit grow without coercion spanking is terrible because it misaligns then development towards self-protection i call it self-protectionism you get an attitude of you know the world's not safe so i have to you know be tough or withdraw you know one of those and so you develop these strange ways of behaving in order to protect yourself because what else are you going to do no, your parents weren't there to protect you while you were developing your core self. And so you kind of get off the rail and you end up with all sorts of strange ideas and you're susceptible in a way you're, <clears throat> you're, have, um, uh, you're susceptible to illness of the mind. <laughs> now, I would like to really build on what Darsha Narvice pointed to in that previous section Discussing child rearing practices, of course, is a really good base of understanding of how we've gotten to where we are today. I really think this is an extremely important subject, especially for those that are choosing to raise children in this time. If there's any future for us, it's going to be in how we choose to reinforce or to break with some of the intergenerational patterns that we have adopted over the centuries. And looking at the legacies of colonialism of things that have happened over hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But this is really important to look at, that we're not, again, an island, that we do not exist in a vacuum, that our behaviors, our personality, and how we develop as individuals and on a cultural collective level has everything to do with our ancestors and the experiences that they had. It's really important that we understand this if we're going to move forward with any sense of understanding of how we can heal some of these traumas that we carry within us. The next person that I would like to feature is going to be building on this point, and that is with Lila June Johnson. Lila is a musician, poet, anthropologist, educator, and community organizer. We discuss her indigenous heritage. She discusses her identity and ancestry regarding that, but she also talks about her European lineage as well, drawing on some of the things that Darsha pointed to in that previous segment. And what I wrote here for this episode is in connecting with that neglected line, Lila uncovers and speaks not only to the intergenerational trauma that indigenous peoples have endured since the colonization of the Americas began, but also the deep and yet to be reckoned with trauma European settlers have carried with them to the so-called New World. And she remarks on the Black Death, the enclosure of the commons, and the witch hunts. In addressing this fundamental truth about the underlying trauma that replicates itself up to the present day in indigenous and non-indigenous communities alike, solidarity can be forged, potentially serving as a force for healing in our time. I just want to speak to how diverse Lila is and how she approaches these subjects in her work. 
Uh, I mentioned some of the things that she's known for. She's an incredible poet, hip-hop artist, singer-songwriter, and her message centers around intergenerational and inter-ethnic healing, as well as in an articulation of Indigenous philosophy. And she discusses throughout her work and briefly touches on as well in this section her life of addiction, abuse, discrimination, and how she eventually overcame many of these battles and how this gave her a vantage point for which to share a message of love, unification, and healing. I, I want to ask if, if you could introduce yourself, but I, I just want to say this really quickly. Um, I think what my first impression, first thing I, I, I think I read or saw of you was I, I was sort of beginning to understand um, for myself uh, as a person who's, a, I guess, a settler in this land. I, I'm not indigenous to this land. Uh, I'm, I live here in Idaho, I guess, or what has been defined as Idaho. And and I, I always felt like there was just something, like I never really felt quite at home where I live, even though I was raised here. And I, I think this unsettled feeling that I've always had, that something just didn't fit. And then through this work and doing this podcast and this interview, I've thought a lot about what whiteness is and how that manifests in like culturally. And I've been then very, been very curious about this idea that, you know, this sort of assumption that I guess I had for a long time that that whiteness and being white meant that, that we didn't have ancestry or connections to our roots. And over time, I began to recognize that's not true at all. And, um, and I think the first thing that I ever came across was you discussing like, yeah, it's great that I can get in touch with my um, uh, Diné uh, heritage and traditions, but there's also a European side to you as well that can be, I, I guess, imagine you had neglected uh, for a long time. And, and forgive me if I'm projecting all these things on you. I just simply wanted to ask you because that was my initial impression of you, this this curiosity that came out of that was this person who wanted to explore that other dimension. And that really touched me because that's something I've been yearning for as well. And I still yearn for. I haven't resolved that in any way. Um, so I guess if framing it within that impression that I just shared with you of yourself, you know, how would you introduce yourself in that framing? Well, I think I'll introduce myself the way I would normally introduce myself. Um, okay, okay. And that does touch on what you're saying. It's not framed within it, but it it does uh, it it is within the frame of my traditional Dene introduction. So um, first, you say Yat e shike aro shidene, and what that means in Dene, or also incorrectly known as Navajo Native American language, it means. Um, Greetings where the sky and the earth meet my kin and my relatives and my people. Um, and you always start your address with that because you're establishing kinship. You're establishing that you are related. No matter which continent our ancestors are from, we are related to each other. We are inseparable, um, uh, inseparably related. Um, and the whole earth is. Um, and then you say, which means I am of the Black Charcoal Streak um, division of the Red Running Into Water clan of the Diné Nation, also incorrectly known as Navajo mm. Nation. Mm -hmm. And so that clan comes from my mother, and she got her clan from her mother, and she got hers from her mother, and so on. So we are a matrilineal people. So our first clan, kind of like a last name, you get it from your dad in, in American culture, uh, we get our last names from our mothers. So that um, keeps the line uh, clear where you where you're descending from on your mother's side, and then I would say Haskai um, which means my father's clan is the Cheyenne, northern uh, southern Cheyenne, um, uh, who now live on a reservation in Oklahoma, and um, my dad's from Dallas, so he's he's mixed blood, um, and uh, then I would say Ashihedeshiche, which means my 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 mother's father's clan is uh, salt, the salt clan of the Diné nation. And then I would say um, uh, Scandinavian, Otto, Scottish, Dachinelle, which means uh, I'm of the Scottish and Scandinavian clan. As far as I know, I still need to do a lot more research, but uh, <clears throat> pinpointing exactly where 
but um, on my father's father's uh, side. So um, that's how you honor all of your four grandparents. Because your mom's mom is your first clan. Your mom's dad is, you know, her, her dad's clan. Your, mom, your dad's mom is his clan because he got it from his mom, right? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it's her mom. And your dad's dad is your nully. We call it nully, your nully lineage. So um, you introduce your four rivers that came together to make you who you are. And so um, uh, I used to try, I used to be ashamed of my fourth clan, you know, like uh, Scottish, Scandinavian. I didn't like to be European because in my household, it it was not really, uh, it was kind of frowned upon to be European because of the history and the legacy of colonization, genocide, slavery, blah, blah, blah. I could go on and on. Um, But yeah, I I introduced myself that way. And then I say, uh, which means my name is Lila June and I present myself as a Dene woman. And Dene really doesn't mean a specific tribe if you really go back. It actually just means human. And so you're saying I present I present myself as a human a, a human woman. Um and so um so but yeah, so I started to do some research on my European lineage. Um, because I didn't feel whole denying and rejecting a whole part of myself. And so I started to research and I found, wow, you know, Europeans and Native Americans are actually so similar. Um, they both have been, had their languages prohibited in the 1920s. If you were caught speaking Welsh in school, you'd have a block of wood tied around your neck with the letters W in, which stood for Welsh, not. And the only way you could get it off your neck is if you found another kid speaking Welsh. So that's how they humiliated the Welsh language out of existence in Wales um, and tried to bring English upon the people. Um, and same in, you know, Celtic and, and Gaelic communities. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we both also, and in, you know, in the, in the United States, as it's now called, they prohibited all Native women from school uh, during the late 1800s and early 1900s or else you'd get your funding for your school taken away. Um, so it was just crazy. Um, and then we also, Europeans and Native Americans, both went through disease epidemics. Um, about 98% of Native Americans were destroyed by disease um, during the process of colonization. And Europe also had the Black Death, which was a third of Europe um, being wiped out overnight, which is a huge trauma that I don't think we as Europeans have really um, processed it. Um, and another really important piece is that um, the, the treatment of women. Um, in my Diné uh, history, uh, thousands of us were marched to a concentration camp outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and thousands of us died in this concentration camp. Hitler would later uh, study it to create his own concentration camps. And um, in order to get water, because we had our, you know, our babies there in the camp with us, and our children. And as women, in order to get water for our children, we'd have to sleep with the soldiers to get water. And so that's how they systematically raped all of our women in the camp. And then the men had to sit by and watch that and hear that. And they couldn't do anything about it because they were held at gunpoint. So similarly in Europe, you have the same thing. You have the destruction of women, which in a roundabout way destroys the spirits of the men who love them. Um, Because if you're a man, you want to protect, right? And if you're being held at gunpoint, you literally can't do your job and it destroys your soul. And so in Europe, they have the witch burning. So they actually burned uh, thousands and thousands of women, drowned them alive, um, raped, beaten, tortured in torture chambers. And so you can imagine being a man, watching your wife being burned alive, watching your sister being burned alive, watching your your mother being burned alive. It will drive a man crazy. So... You basically have a huge assault on both women and the men who love them all throughout Europe. Um, and it was a really crazy hysterical time. And so um, we're, we're very similar, actually. We've gone through the same traumas. It's just that Europeans went through it a couple thousand years earlier than we did. So they have a lot more healing to do and a lot harder time accessing where that healing is that needs to be done. And of course, if you don't forgive your oppressor and the person who hurt you, you are then liable to perpetuate that to other people. So the reason why uh, Europeans came over here and were such buttheads to all the Native Americans is because they were replicating and perpetuating abuse that had happened to them. 
just like a boy um, often who has a father who beats his mom will beat his own wife later on, sometimes, not all the time. And so it's sort of like these uh, perpetuation of cycles of violence. And so uh, all of that really helped me understand that my European lineage is a beautiful lineage. And it has just been really, really, really beat up. I would say worse than what Native Americans had. I'd say it was worse in Europe because we didn't have, at least we didn't have torture chambers here. You know, at least we didn't burn people alive here in the United States. At least, you know, it was a, believe it or not, it was more humane, which isn't saying much than what happened in Europe. It was dark in Europe and it was hard and it was nasty. And so what you have is a, all the only thing that's left to do is have compassion, just have love, have love for my ancestors, my European ancestors and, and give them a space to grieve and feel what happened to us so that we, and forgive, right? So that we don't perpetuate it to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I know that to be very true. And, and this sort of ties into this idea of intergenerational trauma, which you talk a great deal about. And I guess in, in asking, you know, more about you and how you've come to terms personally with intergenerational trauma, um, you know, what was your experience with that? Because I think a lot of people maybe don't even recognize where this um, kind of gaping hole inside them comes from, right? They could be uh, identified as white or a settler, or they could be indigenous. They could be whatever it is. You know, there is this sort of sense that everybody has this in our in our lineage, in our, our past, and it's never been um, addressed or or spoken. There's, there's no one's even said it out loud, and um, and so, you know, for you, what was that process like? Uh, coming to terms with, uh, obviously, coming to terms with your your European lineage, but just as as someone who. <sighs> who really wanted to heal. I mean, I, I think your journey speaks to what a lot of people are yearning for, including, I, I would imagine, maybe I haven't gone through what you've gone through, of course, but that sense of healing and wanting to heal and, and doing that through love and compassion. Um, you know, what was that journey like for you? How, how did you come to where you are today? Yeah, well, that's a big question and it's a beautiful <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, <laughs> intergenerational trauma affects all of us. We could be rich, we could be poor, we could be native, we could be black, we could be white. It doesn't matter who you are. All of us, none of our parents were perfect and their parents weren't perfect and their parents weren't perfect. And so our task is to try and improve the way we parent our children uh, better than our parents were to the extent that we can. Um, and that is a hard process because you have to look at how your caretakers didn't take care of you. And sometimes it's a lot easier to put rose tinted glasses on and say, oh, they loved me and that's love. And I was loved and everything was peachy. I used to tell myself I had a perfect childhood and other people I know who have gone through the healing journey said the same. But once you really start opening it up and looking at it, it's 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 not that pretty. And so I think that's not to judge my parents or anyone's parents. I think it's to actually honor our parents by having the courage to uh, see their shortcomings for what they are instead of rose tinting them and then honor them by ensuring we don't uh, do that to their grandchildren. And I'm sure if our parents had the resources to heal, they would have. But we're coming out of an era where emotional intelligence was not high on the priority list. Um, it was more about intellectual intelligence and uh, physical strength and things. <clears throat> but I think intergenerational trauma can come in all different forms. Um, anything from uh, incest um, to um, domestic violence to alcohol. You know, alcohol is very normalized in the average home. Um, and if you drink beer in front of your kids, they're going to think that's normal and they're going to drink beer, which is seemingly harmless. But at the end of the day, alcohol has done nothing good for the world. It has actually caused a lot of heartache. And um, for instance, my uh, great grandfather was an alcoholic. Then my grandfather was an alcoholic. Then one of my parents was an alcoholic. And then I became an alcoholic. So 
it's literally taken four generations that I know of. Maybe even my great grandfather's father was an alcoholic, but I can trace back at least four generations where that got stuck in my family line for that long. And um, that caused every single generation a whole lot of heartache. <clears throat> and so that addiction is a big form. And I think that rape, you know, we obviously we don't think that's right. We don't like rape in our society, but I don't think people understand just how fundamental rape is to the problems we see in the world. I would actually put rape as the highest priority for us to address in the world, because that's where the root of life, which is the mother, uh, starts to break down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is passed on intergenerationally. If the father, um, for some reason, doesn't teach the children how to interact with women, then that becomes normalized and or vice versa. If the mother doesn't teach the children how to respect the men and, and to honor their choices when it comes to the way they dress, the way they look, the way they are touched, that all gets passed down and we don't even realize it, but it gets passed down through all the things we imply through our language and the way we speak to each other. So there's, <clears throat> that's a really big one. I know a lot of girls if their mothers were never treated with honor and dignity, then they very rarely are able to be treated with honor and dignity because their mother literally can't teach them, can't teach them what, res what respect they deserve because the mother is trying to survive. Um, she's trying to survive rape culture and she doesn't know how. Oftentimes she's not even willing to admit she's been raped because it's so hard to look at and so scary to look at. So she just turns a blind eye on what happened to herself and, and that all gets passed down to the daughters. And so that's a really key one. And, um, but I think for me personally, what it looked like was me looking at my childhood and looking at some very hard things that were hard to look at <clears throat> and, um, even down to, to, um, rejecting my European heritage, you know, that is something that was passed down to me. Um, my father grew up in a very racist era in, in Texas and being white just didn't look very honorable back then where he grew up. Mm -hmm. He didn't like that part of himself. And I can understand why, but the thing is he generalized, he accidentally generalized it and and spread it to all white people ever. And so that was his mistake that he didn't realize and he passed it on to me. So <clears throat> looking at that was hard and realizing like, wow, my whole life I could have been loving this part of myself, but I wasn't. So there's many different things to look at and it all comes down to our courage to not um, rose tint things, but to take those glasses off and really look at the cold, ugly truth um, which is the only, sorry, I just have one last thing to say about this. I know I've been rambling. No, you're question. fine. You're fine. <laughs> no, keep on going. The only thing that prevents uh, these things from being healed um, is that rose tinting process. So why is it that my great grandfather would um, drink and then my grandfather would choose to do the exact same thing? Why on earth would he do that? He knows it hurts. He knows it's damaging. It's because you want anything your parents do, we are, we are hardwired to trust them. And we're hardwired to turn it into love because we just want to feel like someone took care of us. Even if we have to fool ourselves into thinking that that was care and that was love. So that rose tinting is so... Um, uh, I want to say damaging because it is the, it's the vehicle through which these, uh, um, these unhealthy practices get transferred through generation to generation. Take for instance, um, uh, cigarette smoking, right? One of my parents, I won't name who I love my parents. They're wonderful. Um, one of them smoked cigarettes, right? And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> so cool. So I was 
11 years old when I started smoking cigarettes. So why, why am I not acknowledging that cigarettes are literally killing you? It's because I want to have an idol. I want to have someone to look up to. I want to have someone to trust. And I want to believe that whatever this person does, it has to be right. And so that's uh, rose tinting uh, the situation when really, if you really look at it, he's, uh, they're actually um, hurting their own body. And so I think that's just one example of thousands of ways that we uh, accidentally perpetuate what the generation before us uh, gave to us. I think what I really drew out of that interview with Lila, especially after listening to it again just now, is this relationship between the abuser and the abused, how those that are unwilling or unable to integrate their trauma, to address their trauma, to look at that thing or those series of things, those events that have so deeply affected your ancestors and yourself, if you don't do that, then you carry that with you and you produce cultural somas, you produce cultural bodies, and you reinforce cultural bodies that are going to try to not look at that and create all kinds of ways to obfuscate that trauma and to put that on others and then in turn perpetuate the violence that was enacted towards others in order to build the culture and to maintain it. That is what I see everywhere I look, and I see this within myself as well, but I see this around me in this so-called country called the United States of America. I can't help but see it now, now that I at least on some level understand what it is. Especially when we look around today, we see just how fractured everything is, how broken everything feels, how there's just this sort of general sense of anxiety and uncertainty about what to do in the face of these things that we're currently forced to look at, not only climatologically and ecologically, but also within ourselves. So it's important to understand this, and we cannot really heal without addressing these things. It's really fundamental. It's very simple on a really basic level. Look at our history, understand it, and see it for what it is, and then begin to do that work to just say what it is. Don't pretend that it isn't what it is. It may make us uncomfortable, and it may undermine and ultimately abolish the myths and stories that we have been telling ourselves about ourselves. But that's okay, because there are things worth drawing upon that came before this. There are things that we can turn to. And I'm speaking in a very general sense, and I want to make sure that it's understood that I'm figuring this out too. This speaks to what I talked about at the very first part of this series, talking about the ecological and climate crisis, about doing the right thing in spite of the outcome, thinking about this kind of work, this intergenerational work that needs to happen and is currently happening with many people. We don't need to feel like, well, what's the point? Because who knows, maybe in a few decades, we'll all be extinct or something. I do have sometimes a very fatalistic attitude about these things, but nonetheless, I still have that attitude as well of being, I want to feel better in my body. I want to feel more connected to my own body. I want to feel more connected to others as well on a deep level. I want whatever time I have left within this body, of this body, to be good. And so I've been attracted to various individuals who speak to this in their own ways, and Many of them are featured in this this part of this episode. And there was an individual that I came across in doing this work that I had a really profound conversation with. And that individual is Dare Sohe. Dare is an animus counselor and artist. And I would like to begin by talking about what animism is. This is a really important spiritual framework or materialist framework, if you want to look at it that way as well. And animism, as Dare states on their website, is... Briefly, the felt sense that all matter, all bodies are inhabited with spirit, including non-corporal bodies such as ancestors, beliefs, and ideas that exert influence on our bodies, actions, and cultures. All of our ancient ancestors were animus, even though that term is more modern. I also write as a description for this episode that from there, Dare tells me how recognizing our inherent relationships, whether they are secure or insecure attachments to our bodies, the land, ancestors, more than human life and cultural somas, such as white supremacy and this thing we call the United States of America, can allow us to address the fundamental disconnection that is producing the crises we find ourselves in presently. Dare was able to really cut to the core of a lot of this stuff for me, talking about this thing called whiteness that I've grappled with throughout the podcasts that I've produced over the years. 
Because I think, and I'm going to talk about this in the section, that addressing what whiteness is, understanding how it is something that inhabits you, and that you perpetuate it through your blindness, I guess you could say, that it's something like in addressing these non-corporal bodies that I mentioned with you know ancestors, beliefs, and ideas, and so on, these non-corporal bodies inhabit us and affect our perceptions and how we interact and are in relationship with human life and more than human life. So we can view things like whiteness through this animus lens. Again, I have to acknowledge my place in this, but like, like living within the confines of the United States, I did leave the country for two months. I did go to South. I went to South America, went to Brazil for a couple months. And it became very apparent while I was there of how truly white I was. And Mm -hmm. part of that whiteness is just a disconnection. It's just this sort of disconnect. And, and also the thing that we talk about now, of course, is white privilege. And to me, the, the very, (laughs) the thing about whiteness is the fact that it is so seemingly ubiquitous that it is unseen by white people. Mm -hmm. And to me that, that, now that I think more and more about it, that speaks to a really deep trauma. Like mm-hmm. that is something deeply traumatizing or, or something mm-hmm. deeply traumatizing happened. And it wasn't just one thing. Like just like mm-hmm. a, you laid out that history of kind of the rise of agriculture and civilizations and all the you know diasporas of various peoples and all of this. I mean, this goes back very far. And I think one of the defining characteristics of being white is completely – it's to completely deny and pretend that we don't have our own unresolved traumas. And I think about other people's, other cultures. This is the question I'd pose to you is how do other people's that aren't, you know, uh, drunk off of whiteness, so to speak. um, Yeah. (laughs) How do they, how do they engage with, the traumas that inevitably like, I mean, indigenous peoples around the world, I mean, they, they obviously have experienced traumas throughout their histories and they still manage to have some (laughs) sense of connection and an acknowledgement of that connection to the land. And, and I mean, there's just these traditions that have been passed on for a very long time. So for me, I, I look at it, it's not an avoidance of trauma. It's actually somehow grappling with it, working with it, making it very real and, uh, probably developing cultural practices that allow them to do that. So in your experience, how does that, what does that look like? I mean, what does it look like to actually acknowledge and accept your cultural trauma of your people and then work through that? Cause I don't even know what the fuck that looks like. (laughs) I have no direct experience of that. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, I've thought a lot about this and I have drawn a map. So I'm going to share with you that map. And I'm going to put on my neuroscience hat, but I'm also going to put on my animus hat at the same time. Mm. And I'm going to try to give you a map that you can use to um, navigate the land that you're on, which is the land of your body. So the first thing we have to think about is that trauma is unintegrated resource. Another poetic way to say this is that the the poison contains the medicine in a... Um, undigested or pre-alchemical state. Mm. So a trauma is a trauma until it's not. <laughs> uh, yeah. So a trauma is a, a trauma is a problem until it's not. And then it becomes something more like resource. And that's a very strange alchemical process that everyone has to sort of figure out on their own. But let's just sort of put that new definition in the sort of in the sort of uh you know, the whiteboard that we're generating here in the internet land is that trauma is unintegrated resource. It's, it's, it's not yet medicine. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's that. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. So I was doing a whole bunch of uh, healing work on my own in my own life. I was sick for about 10 years I had GI dysfunction, kind of like a Crohn's disease thing that I couldn't fucking figure out. My immune system was just rotten. I was I was an alcoholic. Like I was just not living right. Yeah. And I was really kind of trying to figure my way out and I was I was doing various things. I was, you know, taking dance classes and somatics classes and embodiment classes and yoga and breath work and 
I was doing entheogenic, you know, medicines and, and, you know, I was doing this all very DIY. So it's not like I was flying to Peru. I didn't have that fucking money, but I was just, (laughs) I was just trying to figure something out based on what was going on in my nervous system and in my head. And I had had very strange experiences from when I was a child of hearing voices and seeing things and not talking to anybody about it because I was in a place where if I had talked to somebody about it, they'd have fucking shoved drugs down my throat, you know, like I knew this from a very young age that our society, this kind of white society that I was brought up in and indoctrinated by was actually not on my side. Mm -hmm. I knew that, but I could, but I have light enough skin that I could kind of pass off as a white person. Right. Yeah. But inside I was hearing all sorts of voices and I was having the craziest dreams and I did not know left from right. I was a mess, right? I yeah. was a mess. Yeah. So I grew up being a mess and, you know, I discovered alcohol in my early twenties and I was like, this is great. I can kind of tune out for a while. And you know, that has its own sort of cost benefit thing, right? Sure. Um, so eventually I'm, you know, you know, I'm, I'm really sick starting at age 28. I'm really starting to get really sick and I'm like holding together with like bubble gum and band-aids, you know, and I'm really like spending all the money I make on like natural paths and Chinese medicine doctors. And I'm trying to figure out what the fuck is going on, you know, like, yeah. oh, I'm allergic to these foods and now suddenly I have parasites and now I have toxic metals. It's like, it's a whole, like I went down the rabbit hole, right? Right. So I was doing all this work and I was, um, also, you know, through the entheogenic medicines, you know, talking to spirits and I was reading books on magic and chaos magic and all this stuff. And I was doing pretty well at a certain point. At a certain point, I was, you know, about 35-ish or something. And um, I had kind of gotten over my chronic GI issues through sort of like right nutrition and Chinese medicine and herbs and acupuncture and meditation. Like I had gotten somewhere. Like it's not like I was completely at a dead end. It's like I had crawled out of a ditch on some level. Mm -hmm. Um, But I noticed something about my relationships, especially sexual relationships. So intimate relationships. I noticed that they weren't very good. <laughs> and I, I personally couldn't control some of my reactions to certain uh, conversations or emotions or stimuli. Like I would just fall into these weird pits of like depression or anxiety or like confusion. And I was like, okay, I thought I I thought all of this problem was was from the GI stuff and from like the illness, but I'm not really sick anymore. Mm. So what is actually going on? And I really had to sit with that. And if, and I helped. I called up one of my you know best friends at the time, and I was like, "Can you please come over and pour all this alcohol in my house down the toilet? <laughs> you know, so I can <laughs> actually so I can actually maybe figure out something else. You know, mm-hmm. and so." I I was doing a lot of research and I'd always been doing a lot of research, but I started looking even closer at certain things. And I was really asking the question. I was asking the question of my body and of spirit. I was asking, what did I miss? I've been doing all this research for like 10, 15 years. I have all this lived experience. What did I, what did I bypass? What did I, what did I have a blind spot on that I was just not willing to look at? And I listened to this fucking podcast once. And it answered the question. Um, Someone was talking about animism and I was like, oh, what's this term? Oh, animism. Oh, I think I kind of am doing that, but I've never really researched that. What are they talking about? And they said that the three pillars of an animist culture were connection to the land, connection to the ancestors and connection to great spirit. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, something began sort of emerging out of my like associative network of all the things I had ever researched and ever practiced and all the magic I had ever done. Something started to emerge that was actually quite clear, like not just a jumble of words, but like an actual map. And this is what, this is what the map was because I had also at this time been doing a lot of research into interpersonal neurobiology and attachment theory based in sort of like Bowlby's work. And attachment theory, just quickly, is 
they did a bunch of work, you know, white Western psychology did a bunch of work on how babies um, cling to their moms or, or avoid their mothers or like these kind of weird attachment styles that babies sometimes do that are not secure. They're insecure, mm-hmm. but, if, but they can be insecure in a bunch of ways, right? Yeah. Yeah, you could be anxious, you could be avoidant, you could be anxious avoidant, you could be dysregulated attachment, or you could have this weird thing that is like the holy grail, which is secure attachment, right? Yeah. And so at this moment of listening to this podcast and reading these books and just really thinking and feeling into things, I recognize something about our ancestors and what they had secure attachment with. And I actually understood something that I'm calling animist attachment theory, which is not the same as Western attachment theory. So I just want to be very clear on that. You won't, you probably won't find animist attachment theory in any research. It's something that I sort of named so that I could talk about it. Right, right. right. And so I said, wait a second. Let's take a mother in an animist culture and just go through the motions of what their life is like. Hmm. They have a child. But during birth, they're surrounded by midwives and doulas singing songs and chanting and uh, giving them medicines on their body and painting and all this kind of beautiful thing. And they're in a special hut or tent, or maybe they're out in the fields and they've done ritual. And this is how the baby gets born. Mm -hmm. And already the baby has distributed secure attachment. Mm -hmm. Already. It's a non-nuclear family setup already from the beginning. It happens. Right. Now we go into how does the child grow up? Well, if you look at a lot of these cultures, the child is strapped to the back of the mother for a long time, sort of like a little baby primate is. So they have this kind of co-regulation, breathing and heartbeat and warmth thing going on for a while. And there's also a kind of pressure because they wrap the children in a certain way to sort of give them that sort of like stimulus of a, that sensory stimulus, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then also when they're able to start like crawling and walking, they're taken care of by the extended family or the extended village of siblings, aunties, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So right from the get-go, the mother is not the only source of attachment. Mm, Right. So I looked at this. I looked at this really hard in my own gut. And I said, wait a second. What happens when that kid has a problem? Let's just, you know, the kid, you know, hurts themselves somehow. They break their leg or something bad happens to the kid. You know, shit happens to kids, you know? Right, right. Um, What does that kid do? Do they have anxious attachment? Do they run to their mother? Like, and I sort of think about this and I thought, so let's say they do run to their mother. And they're like, mommy, mommy, I need your help. Um, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. And, you know, like, I'm fucked up. You know, like, I don't know what's happening. (laughs) The kid's not going to say that, but I'm I'm pantomiming. I'm like, what is this kid doing? And I thought, how does the mother in that society have enough resource to hold that child? Hmm. And it dawned on me that mother grew up in a place where she had secure attachment to the land. Mm. So the kid is getting this modeling the whole way through that their mother is not the source of their nourishment as much as it is the land that is the source of their mother's nourishment. Mm. And then I went farther and then I went farther and I said, okay, let's assume that the mother has secure attachment to the land. Let's assume that. (laughs) And let's assume that the mother has secure attachment to the ancestors and the spirits because there was a functioning ritual lineage in that village. Let's just assume that everyone walking around has more or less secure attachment with the land, the ancestors, and the spirits. And I was like, then I looked at America. (laughs) I looked at my life. And I thought to myself, What is preventing people from having secure attachment with the land, the ancestors, and the spirits in a way that actually matters and is not conceptual? Mm. This is the difference. Because secure attachment is not an idea. It's a nervous system state that lives in the body. Mm -hmm. So that means it has to be directly felt and not abstractly thought about. 
right? Right. So I said, what's the thing obstructing people now? And this is me because I'm looking at it to solve my own problem. I'm like, what's, what's preventing me from having secure attachment with the land, the ancestors, and the spirits? What's the first obstacle? And I realized, oh, the Cartesian wound of separating mind from body means that we don't have secure attachment to our body, which is made of earth. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we don't have secure attachment to earth because we don't have secure attachment to our body because they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. And this is how I started to find a map. And I was able to go, great. So now I have a roadmap. Develop secure attachment to my body, specifically my lower body, which contains the soil of my microbiome, right? Mm -hmm. And my genitals and my intestines and all that stuff. Develop secure attachment to my body, specifically lower body. Develop secure attachment to the earth and all of the various kinds of earth that we can have. So there, I can go into this later, but it's not as simple as just the whole earth because there's the land that you're on and the land that I'm on. And there's the land that our ancestors were on, and there's the lands that were there when we were born. So there's a different kinds of place, right? It's not just this monolithic kind of land thing. It's like specific, right? Yeah. yeah. And then there's secure attachment to ancestors, which I was really avoiding, mm. right? It mm -hmm. goes back to my little setup. What was I missing? What was I blind about? It was ancestor work. It was developing secure attachment to the ancestors. And then there's secure attachment with spirits. And that could be religion. That could be deity. That could be whatever. It doesn't, it's kind of a, it's kind of a like catch all for like everything else that I haven't said yet. Mm -hmm. right? It's like body and earth, ancestors. Okay. What, a, what every other thing that doesn't quite fit into those categories, we'll just call it spirit. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is my general, hopefully easy to understand roadmap for how a person, whether they're white or not, could actually feel like good being alive on this planet, even given the immense amount of work that we have to do to sort of maybe clean up or reconcile with the past. Mm -hmm. So I'll pause there and just be like, I know I said a lot of info, <laughs> yeah. but I'm going to pause there because I really wanted to show you the whole map and then we can dive into different parts of it. Yeah. Well, it reminds me, I was looking uh, at a post you posted on uh, Facebook and it's very short, but you say, I am asking you all, I'm asking you to see all the ancestors, not just the ones you identify with. So say you get to that level where you are connecting to your ancestors and I've definitely um, uh, not that I know this personally from personal experience, but other people who practice a form of animism, um, in connection to ancestors, to their ancestors, there does seem to be this thing where like, I have these particular ancestors that I am attached to, that I speak to, that I have a relationship with, but you speaking about your, you know, mixed race, very diverse background, which I'm sure is just incredibly complex. It's like a a knot of all these different relationships uh -huh. and traumas and also probably really beautiful yeah. things that have come out of that, obviously. Yeah. It's not one thing. It's everything. Yeah. Not one thing. Yeah. And you're, you're basically in that post. I'm just quoting there was you're saying we need to have a relationship with all of them. We need to acknowledge all the ancestors. So I was thinking about that. Like, I think particularly for white people, this is where this idea of white guilt kind of comes in a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to have to apologize for something my ancestors did. You know, slavery is over. I don't, I don't need to, I've heard white people say this shit a lot. Yeah, yeah. And even I am like, yeah, like my ancestors came here from Europe in the late 1800s. They didn't own slaves as far as I know. Um, sure. But, you know, we're not, that, that's not really the point, you know, it's, 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 it's doesn't, really <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what do you think about that idea of integrating all of your ancestors into your practice and to, um, yep. healing and, and overcoming trauma and, and becoming, having secure attachment and all these things you've mentioned previous, yeah. uh, yeah. to this, uh, yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So I want to be really clear with folks. I don't think people should do ancestor like direct ancestral work until they have some kind of secure attachment with their body and the earth 
so that the earth can mediate those relationships in a way that's titrated and safe and not like not prone to dissociation. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about ancestor work, I'm not, I'm not saying jump right in. I'm saying be very deliberate and careful as in full of care with how you uh, encounter relationships that might bring up your attachment issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when a lot of people think of ancestors, they go back about 300 years and they stop. (laughs) And what I'm saying is that's an attachment issue. That's actually an attachment issue. That's a trauma that is sort of siloing off some people from other people. Mm -hmm. It's a separation. It's a kind of like, oh, these are my ancestors. Those are your ancestors. And I'm saying, yeah, that's the trauma that's talking to us right now. Mm. That's the trauma because the trauma is a tribalist kind of trauma, which is like, uh, you know, my, the Hatfields versus the McCoys or something, you know? Yeah. But you recognize both the Hatfields and the McCoys have the same grandparents on some level. Like there's no difference between the Hatfields and the McCoys. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. They're just, they just have forgotten that they're the same family and uh, it's a convenient amnesia so that they can sort of keep feeding the revenge fetish, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is really real because there are plenty of spirits and ghosts that don't care about um, morals or ethics. They just don't operate that way. And it's not like they're evil. It's just, they don't fucking care. So we have to get really clear on like who we're feeding with our actions and which, which ghosts are sort of temporarily or, or, you know, partially possessing us into sort of some of these behaviors that we think are ours, like these opinions and these beliefs that we have as people where the fuck did they come from and why did we just ingest them so easily? Right. Like, why? Like, why not just recognize like, oh, if I go back far enough, um, uh, all of our ancestors are black. It's right. just basic. Yeah. And so here's the deal that I think, like, this is like, I think, the white supremacy problem. White people... And I'm talking generally here. I'm not talking about you, but you might be related to what I'm talking about. So maybe it's useful for you. Sure. If all white people had the direct experience of their black ancestors loving them unconditionally, they would fight racism with every breath. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's very simple. It's extremely simple. Yeah. And yes, all the terrible things that have happened. Yes, all of that. And I want to be very specific. When I say black ancestors, I'm not necessarily talking about modern blackness or modern black culture as we in social justice talk about it today. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the very real reality that all of our human pre-human ancestors arose from this place that we call Africa that was a different shape and Pangea and all that stuff, right? Like the tectonic plates were different and all that stuff, right? Yeah. But every single one of those ancestors had extremely dark skin. They were, for all intents and purposes, black people. Mm-hmm. There's no difference. But and and then somewhere along the migration and the floods that happened and the Pangaeic kind of uh, shifts that happened and all continents that basically sank beneath the sea, like this is all on record, right? It's not fake. I'm not making any of this up. But throughout all of that diasporic um, exploration and migration and nomadic hunter gatherers, different mutations and different like gene expressions started to emerge. And then we started to get different color hair and different color skin and and all this, you know, kind of just beautiful diversity started to emerge. Right. But this is, this isn't right or wrong. This isn't good or evil. This isn't any of that. This isn't even better or worse. This is just life loves diversity. If something goes on long enough, it will become diverse. It bifurcates, just like the cells in the embryo. One becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes blah, 32. You know, it's just like whoosh, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have a real issue with people 
saying, well, these are mine and those are yours. And um, there's an arbitrary line in between us. And what I'm saying is just, you don't have to understand this on a cognitive level. But even if all white people just every day said something very simple, like I acknowledge all of my ancestors, regardless of what they have done, regardless of how close I feel to them, regardless of whether I know their names, but I acknowledge all of their sacrifices, all of their choices, even if I don't agree with them, it would go a long way to opening up the nervous system to something that you could actually feel good in your body instead of like queasy, disgusted, disconnected, and exiled. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanna I wanna make it very clear that the animism that the, the animism and the trauma healing that I practice doesn't have to be complicated if you aren't interested in that. It can be so ridiculously simple that it feels like it's not useful. It might feel like it's too simple to matter, but actually it matters. It just matters. And the only way that you can prove it is not to believe me. I'm not asking anyone listening to believe me or even trust me. I don't want any of it. What I want you to do is actually practice and pay attention. And when you do that, you start to actually uh, develop a kind of pattern recognition that might actually be useful for you in your life, where you are with your family, mm -hmm. rather than this other thing that keeps happening, which is fragility, dissociation, bypassing, shame, blame, guilt. All of these things are very convenient distractions from the actual thing, which is, hey, white people, don't you want to feel better? Don't you want to feel better? Like actually better? Oh, oh that just yeah. like cuts to the core of it. Yeah. You like kind of, yeah. yeah, you took me back. I was like, uh -huh. holy shit. Yeah, that's the point. It's just to open all the doors and windows and get some fresh air in the goddamn room, you know? Yeah. Like there's no need to, a lot of the white trauma is um, this exile problem. The, mm -hmm. the loss of land and culture from things like the Roman invasion and the Spanish Inquisition and all of that kind of crazy stuff that really ripped people from the lands that they were in relationship with. And then they had to sort of like move to another continent and then become white in order to survive. And it was all like, OK, let's just look at that and be like, what was it like before that happened for a second? And really feel that just for even half a moment to just be like, you had ancestors, I don't know how long ago, a few generations, more than a few generations, some time ago, but you had ancestors that could put their bare feet on the ground and talk directly to the land they were on. It was very simple. They could just do it. And yeah. some people could do it better. And some people had like some people were like the witch doctor and some people were like the oracle and some people were the farmer and everyone could do it differently. But on some basic level, it was just fucking normal human. Mm -hmm. It's normal human to be able to do that. And now we're on a different land that has been tended by different people with different spirits and no one's really figured out on a mass level how to negotiate and talk and communicate cross-culturally and cross-spiritually so that we could just be like, look, we know it was a mess getting here, but let's, um, let's try to all feel better together and let's really be here together so that we can, as a human species, move forward together. That's still not really a conversation that's being had. That interview with Dare was really profound for me. Uh, Dare really points to the heart of it. And jumping off from there, I would like to discuss something that to me is very connected. There's a lot of threads here that I'm trying to pull on and trying to follow. And again, in trying to construct this part six of this episode 300, 
trying to navigate all of these different sections that I wanted to throw together of my interviews and trying to find a way to flow them into one another. It was a little bit challenging, but I think the next person I would like to feature does fit into this pretty well. And I think just having a little bit of understanding as I'm going to speak for myself, someone who is, as we talked about with Dare, I am white. I am somebody who has felt a rootlessness as far as my place here on this continent. And as was discussed in previous segments, I had come to understand at least some of the reasons for why those that are descendant of settlers and colonizers feel the way they do and act in the ways that they do. And the kind of blindness that comes with that can lead to all kinds of behaviors and ways of being that are perpetuating abuse and trauma towards other living beings and that reinforces itself and that we carry these sort of non-corporal bodies as Dara pointed to in their description of animism. And this is really important to understand and work with. Now this points to something that I think is really important that I was able to explore with an individual that I've already featured in this series back in part three discussing the pandemic Uh, Matthew Remsky, along with Julian Walker and Derek Barris, they're the co-hosts of the Conspirituality Podcast, discussing QAnon, the health and wellness community, how there's these intersections between these far-right conspiracy theories and the kind of libertarianism of the health and wellness influencers. Now, before Matthew had started that podcast, I had interviewed him towards the end of 2019, releasing that episode in early 2020. And just give you a little bit of background here on Matthew He is a yoga practitioner, teacher, and author of Practice and All is Coming, Abuse, Cult Dynamics, and Healing in Yoga and Beyond. Uh, Like I said, he's the co-host now of Conspirituality. In the interview at large, we discuss his work exposing the forms of cult dynamics within yoga and the spiritual communities that we see here in North America, and I'm sure in many other parts of the world as well. Sexual abuse, which is pervasive in the yoga community. To quote from an article that he had published in The Walrus, modern yoga has been fraught with stories of charismatic yoga teachers who promoted their teachings as spiritually pure and later abused or otherwise took advantage of students who believed their mentors were gurus and saints. And so sexual misconduct and abuse is this very common thing in the yoga community. And I ask him, why is that the case? And in this part that I'm going to be sharing, he places a lot of this, and this stuff is related to what I talked about with Dare, and the previous segments I featured of interviews as well, in discussing how the descendants of settlers and colonizers are rootless people. There's this tendency to appropriate other religious and spiritual traditions in order to find meaning and purpose in our lives. Because we have been so cut off from our ancestry and our own heritage, there is this hungry ghost phenomena where we feel entitled to taking from other cultures, other spiritual traditions, and making them our own. And what's really important here is that, no, it's not that you can't do these things. It's not like you can't work with Buddhism or you can't work with yoga. That's not the issue. But it's worth understanding how these spiritual or bodywork practices exist within a neoliberal economic system. And that's what Matthew is going to explain here and how this sort of hyperfixation on individualism, on the kind of libertarian orientation of health and wellness within contemporary spirituality and health and wellness communities, how this has created a condition in which these types of dynamics can emerge, where you do have abuse, but you also have this kind of grasping or yearning for purpose that can be very detached from the material conditions in which we operate under and within, particularly within the legacy of neoliberal exploitation, globalized economic expansion, and colonialism. It's interesting because I think there's a lot of, uh, for me, this queasiness or wariness of this language around being woke or being awake, uh, which I know that in yoga and and kind of Eastern spiritual traditions and Buddhism, um, that's kind of the premise is enlightenment. You know, you can achieve some sort of enlightenment. And I think the way it can be presented to the West is it is a commodifiable thing. It's something you can go, you can go to a retreat in Maui and you can attain something like that, you know, by spending six weeks with some guru or whatever. Um, And it's, it's always been a bit perplexing to me because I don't think there's, there aren't the connections made that I think that need to be made when it comes to 
um, the fact that you feel like you have to go to this this island that was colonized <laughs> by <laughs> Americans, you know, and you go there to have this little spiritual retreat. I, I don't think those connections are often made by those that are participating in it. Um, it's like the materiality, the the material conditions that we're a part of are not really addressed. And it, to me, it kind of reinforces this idea, this false dichotomy between the sp- between spirit and matter. Maybe you could speak to that a bit, but this idea that what's happening in the world isn't really that that that'll, that's not gonna that's not gonna liberate you. You you have to be liberated through your own will to wake up and be enlightened and to detach yourself from everything that's happening around you to elevate yourself above it. And yeah, and yet and yet it will take material. Um, resources and and those will have consequences that somehow I mean the thing the thing about the thing about the last 50 years of global Buddhism and yoga is that it in some ways it's provided a way for uh, the neoliberal vision of freedom through consumerism to be spiritualized mm. so that um, you know, you can convince yourself that you need to go to Costa Rica to find yourself. Uh, <laughs> and if you and if and if you drink fair trade coffee, but you also soak in the 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 heat and the humidity of the jungle, that there will be some internal transformation that will uh, create a new self that will then radiate back out into you know your urbanized global north environment and will change everything for the better. Like that's the that's the the, the sort of subtext. Um, and you know, it was about, I don't know, five years ago that I first had a conversation with this independent researcher named, uh, Brian Francis Culkin, who, uh, researches, um, gentrification in specific locations, especially Boston. And, and he's talking about, you know, we started talking about like, how did the modern yoga studio emerge? Like, how did it, how did it come to be? And, uh, he pointed out that, uh, it's, it's the yoga studio in the modern urban global North setting only really comes into existence through the process of gentrification. In fact, it's often on the leading edge of gentrification. And so, um, now, and Naomi Klein in no logo opens uh, the first, in the first few pages, she talks about um, one of the, the major first major yoga studios in Toronto actually being established in the beautiful old warehouse space that used to be uh, the home of a garment manufacturer in the garment district in Toronto. Uh, and that was available for lease because um, free trade agreements in the mid 90s sent all of those manufacturing jobs to Vietnam. But suddenly in Global North spaces, we have these gorgeous brick buildings with hardwood floors and white walls, and they're empty of all of their machinery, and nobody's making anything in them anymore. And so, and so people move into them and begin these practices that are about remaking the self, right? And they're, they're usually wearing the yoga clothes that are made by the people whose labor got outsourced in Vietnam who couldn't possibly afford to go to those yoga classes. Oh, and like, man. so, and so, and, and, and so, but, but, and this is like this key thing that, that Culkin really helped me understand is that like, um, the, the modern yoga space is, exists because of, you know, paradigmatic changes in labor and the meaning of the body uh, in globalization through the ascendancy of technology and finance, uh, and through the transformation of the urban landscape into the monotone of gentrification. And what she says, what's amazing about that passage in, in no logo is that like, I know the people who founded that yoga studio in 1996 (laughs) in Toronto, like they're my friends and, and, they, their lease only lasted for a few years. And guess who moved in afterwards? Uh, like a dot com company who could afford the raised rent. And so where did the yoga studio go? It went out west on Queen Street, farther out to the leading edge of gentrification at that point. And now it's running out to the end of its lease. So anyway, yoga studios have like five year leases. Uh, and then they have to move out to 
the leading edge of wherever the city is continuing to gentrify. But the upshot of this is that what yoga practitioners don't realize is that they're they're participating in a kind of embodied neoliberalization of the actual city. And then they're participating in this practice, and especially if they professionalize into it, they're kind of per- participating in, in a way uh, of making all of the aspects of neoliberal economy, the fact that it works on flex time, the fact that it's gig economy, the fact that it's all about self-motivation and self-responsibility, all of these themes are embedded into this practice by which you're supposed to take care of yourself and seek your own betterment, make yourself healthy, uh, you know, become a better citizen. If you're a woman, you're supposed to be even wear even more hats and be a feminist at the same time while you're leaning into your postures and making more green shape. <laughs> And like, and so, and so there's all of this, all of these demands placed upon, uh, the person who basically is creating no product, uh, but the aspirational self. And then, and then yoga discourse and Buddhist discourse gives a kind of spiritual aspect to that. Uh, and, you know, so, so when those things, those things started to come together, together for me about five years ago, I started to develop this you know, analysis, a political economy analysis of the body in modern yoga as being, uh, the, the, the sort of like, you know, what, what is the, what is the person actually bowing down in front of? Um, it's not nature anymore. It's not, uh, tradition particularly. Uh, it's a kind of manufactured sense of individual freedom, uh, that uh, is at the heart of the neoliberal project. That's not all that's going on. That sounds terribly cynical, but I mean that's a big part of uh, that's a big part of the story. That's why the the yoga world has exploded uh, at the same time that we've seen this you know proliferation of the effects of globalization. Yeah. Well, you do make this in the video I did see of you uh, talking about this subject to some to, to in some depth, but. You were saying as we see the neoliberal project really take off globally, that's when we start seeing global carbon emissions rise, global climate change is really taking off as well as that's exactly when the yoga, uh, global yoga popularity phenomenon really started to take off as totally. well. Oh, it's, they're and it's they're tied together. By, right. And it's driven by, and nobody really thinks about the fact that that um, sort of the, the, the global yoga economy it booms in relationship to um, cheapening air travel and, uh, and and looser credit, like deregulated credit. Uh, so all of the yoga communities that I have known and been involved in, especially those that develop into high demand groups, um, they're all, everybody is overspending on their credit cards. Uh, you know, everybody is flying to this retreat and that retreat and accumulating trainings so that they can um, become even more self-actualized. Uh, yeah. And so, and so, um, the, the tie-ins are pretty, the tie-ins are pretty clear. And, and when, when I think, I think Brian said, you know, uh, yoga is the de facto spirituality of neoliberalism. It, it demands that people be flexible and receptive. It demands that people lean in. It demands that people become more, um, uh, self-responsible. And I think particularly for an 80% female practice population, that has like real grave implications for whether or not yoga is actually feminist. Mm, yeah, that's great. That's a great point. I never thought of it that way. I mean, making that, drawing that connection there. Absolutely. So, you know, this is something I've also, uh, uh explored with psychedelics because that's kind of my, my little foray, if I could say in my personal life into spirituality or or whatnot since leaving my you know religion that i grew up with behind as a teenager but you know having my first psychedelic experiences i just sort of took for granted that oh it's it's like like for instance let me just say this with yoga obviously if done in the right way the right context um it's just like any sort of physical activity uh or spiritual practice if done properly, it's really beneficial for the individual. And, and if done in a community context, it's probably really good for the community as well. Right. Mm. And that's what right. I think attracts people to it. They sense that, okay, this is, 
obviously they feel better when they do it. It challenges right. them. There's a lot of things going on. And the same thing for me with with my psychedelic experiences. So then I just took for granted that everything that was happening within this sort of growing popularity, uh, again, with psychedelics, that that was the case. But as I started to delve more deeply into it, the same phenomenon's happening with, say, the ayahuasca industry, where right. you have people in the global north going down to Peru or other places in South and Central America and engaging in this sort of theater uh, that's put on for them. Right. Um, to sort of heal them of their, you know, very legitimate concerns about trauma. And uh, obviously, I think our population is pretty severely traumatized in general. Right. So it makes sense why people are seeking it. Um, and, and, but in a way, it's perpetuating things that have been going on for centuries, which is a form of colonialism. Right. Um, and it's manifesting maybe as neoliberalism or, or what have you. But uh, people need to be conscious of this and have a sort of political uh, social consciousness that I don't think is often encouraged in these settings there again it's it's focusing so much on the individual self actualization um and is perpetuating this neoliberal ideal uh in the society and the people participating in it um but yeah I don't know right you... well I, let me just say that the parallel between um the explosion in like ayahuasca services or spirituality and or the ayahuasca economy and the global yoga economy i think shares an aspect of the the, the global north's search for authenticity in the face of its rootless white settler status mm -hmm. and, and so and so one thing that i i was I've become very aware of not just through personal experience, but through a lot of observation and research is that the concept of looking for something authentic, close to nature, uh, of the earth from a location is like an obsession for people who feel, uh, rootless and, uh, kind of erased from their location. People who, grew up in subdivisions that look like the next subdivisions or people who know that this whole foods has exactly the same stock as that whole foods. Uh, and, and when, and when you don't know where you are from and you have some maybe unconscious understanding that, uh, being from a place means that you can have some sort of reality or some sort of touchstone for for actions that are that have integrity uh, then you know the the global south becomes this sort of uh, i don't know like a like a a place where identity and rootedness and plant medicine and uh you know tradition can be can become very attractive to the point of fetishization. Mm -hmm. You know, like this became super clear to me when uh, I'm, I'm here in Montreal, actually. I just finished uh, working in a training program here at, at, a, at, a, at a yoga school. And in this same city, um, maybe three or four years ago, uh, uh, this uh, a, a person who has since become a friend of mine named Dexter, who's uh, Sri Lankan by background and is trying to like reconstitute the Buddhism that has been nurtured by his family lineage. Although, you know, he's there in the diaspora and, and it's, it's hard to do that. It's, it's hard to figure out where that tradition is for, uh, the family now. Uh, and they're also like, uh, you know, super active, uh, political, activist and agitator and, uh, you know, um, and, you know, an ecological activist. And, um, this is somebody I like really, really admire, but there's something about their, uh, connection with Indian wisdom culture that for me is kind of abstract still, even though I long to be closer to it. And he, anyway, they were in this, they were in this class three years ago and I'm at the front of the room mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I'm and I'm supposed to be giving I'm supposed to be giving sort of like a a learning outline for looking at uh, this particular yoga text, and uh, they put up their hand and they say, you know what I want to understand better is why do you people uh, looking at me and around the room because the the rest of the room was mostly white why do you people uh, insist on playing with our old stuff 
Uh, <laughs> why are you so interested in, in, in like playing with our old things? And I said, Oh, can you, can you say a little bit more about that? Because I could feel myself start to sweat. Right. And, and, and they said, they said, well, you know, it's like, don't you have your own old things? Don't you have your own, don't you have your own culture, your own, your own antiquities? Uh, I don't even have access to my culture's antiquities. Uh, why are you trying to, why do you have such an interest in them? Uh, I mean, aren't they already in your museums? And I'm like, oh boy. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and I realized at that moment that like having grown up Catholic, that for, you know, a large part of my teenage years, I was like, fascinated in Catholic esotericism. Like I wanted to know everything that I could know about Hildegard of Bingen and the herbal blends that she made while she sang her heavenly songs and whatever. And like John of the cross. And I was so interested in that stuff. And then it just kind of all fell away because I was generally betrayed. I felt betrayed by the institution of the Catholic church. And, and so, and, and it made me understand that when I am with my friend Dexter, like, I know that they're from somewhere. Like, I know that they have something like the, 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 the culture, the identity is informed and shaped and like forever altered by oppression and colonialism, but they're from somewhere. And I don't feel like I'm from anywhere. And my attraction to Buddhism and yoga was about this was in part about this, the emptiness of rootlessness that I think is part of of the phenomenon of being white. And so, um, it, that's, that adds another layer of, of weirdness to traveling down to, uh, the, to the jungles of South America to find the, the shaman who's going to administer ayahuasca or traveling to, you know, South India so that I can stay in a Tibetan monastery for six weeks and try to learn something from somebody who comes from a totally, completely different, uh, experience of life than I do, but I, I want, I want the realness of their experience. I want, I want the, 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 the locale, the, 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 um, the connection to the earth. I, I, I want all of the things that they have and that paradoxically my culture has stolen. And so mm -hmm. it's very, it's like, it's, it's a real, it's a, it's an amazing thing to contemplate, uh, and then to bear witness to it's, it's not like I can solve these things, but I can, uh, I can certainly stop being a consumer of them and start being a critic of my own, um, of my own, of my own participation. I appreciate the clarity that Matthew brings to this subject, his own personal experiences, along with his very careful analysis of these dynamics between the neoliberal economic system and how spirituality or our understanding of spirituality within that framework manifests, I think that's really important to understand because when we, as people who have not fully reckoned with our history, have not fully reckoned with our rootlessness and where that comes from, we can act in ways that are appropriative and actually just perpetuate a lot of the same dynamics that got us here to begin with. This again points to some of the earlier segments I featured around intergenerational trauma, how it reproduces itself. And I think it can mask itself, it can come in all these different forms in which we may not recognize it. And, you know, a lot of the, the crises we're in the midst of currently regarding a crisis of meaning does stem from this sort of hollowness that is indicative of settler culture or lack of culture. And I think what Dare pointed to, and I think also what the next person is going to be pointing to as well, can help us understand where this rootlessness leads to, what it produces as far as dynamics within even social justice movements and other movements in which we're really trying to engage in really meaningful decolonial anti-racist work and things like this. And I think the next person, Tada Hazumi, will be able to clarify some of this. And I interviewed Tada shortly after I interviewed Dare Sohei. I uh, actually wanted to interview them both together, but it was suggested, I think, by Dare that we actually do it separately. I think that was actually a very good idea. Their work intersects a lot. They have worked together quite a bit in the past. And I think with Tata, uh, I'll just provide a little bit of background on Tata. Uh, Tata is a cultural somatics practitioner and teacher. We explore in the interview the cultural somatic framework that encapsulates their approach in addressing systemic oppression, colonized bodies, dance, ancestral trauma, and call-out culture. 
and I will provide a definition of Tata's work around the cultural somatics framework, they state on their website that, one, cultures are in fact bodies, or rather cultural somas, that emerge from networks of relationships. Cultural somas are intangible in nature, yet can function similarly to our own body that has a delicate nervous system. The fractal relationship between individual and cultural somas show us that all somas, large and small, are meant to be in co-healing with one another. Two, the above-mentioned cultural somas are also fields in which all intangible beings, ones our elder cultures referred to as ancestors, spirits, and goddesses, gods, exist. Even abstract concepts such as white supremacy or misogyny exist as beings in this field. This shows us that we are all a part of a common field and the healing of intangible beings like ourselves is interconnected with the healing of intangible beings that for the greater networks of relationships that we all commonly belong to. So I think this is really interesting because it's interplays with the uh, interviews I did about how these ideas that have been passed down through the legacy of colonialism, the abuses that have produced the colonial realities in which we are a part of, that those are actually bodies that live through us. When we seek healing, when we seek to undo these things that are producing abusive patterns that need to be broken, as Matthew discussed in that previous segment, we have to understand that there are certain things living through us, through our nervous systems, and that we are in fact connected to larger cultural bodies that are in fact bodies. Now, this may seem a bit odd and woo-woo, But at the very least, it is a framework for which we can understand the psychosis of colonialism, the psychosis of capitalism, of extraction, of the continued destruction of our ecologies and the entire biosphere. That we are colonized bodies that are perpetuating this abuse in perpetuity. We can pretend through our spiritual bypassing, through the appropriation of indigenous Uh, forms of knowing and being and spirituality, we can pretend that we can uh, elevate ourselves above this, but we can't. And if we think that we can, and if we do do this without consciously realizing it, especially, we're never going to really fully engage with what needs to be done in order to address white supremacy, what needs to be done to address patriarchal patterns and value systems. So a lot of my observations that I had around dance culture was a lot of the reasons uh, why I started exploring my ancestry and kind of like, I, I suck at dancing, frankly, but starting to be like, Hey, you know, what's the relationship between like this and martial arts? So I started studying like kind of martial arts somatics. And so I read a lot of Japanese stuff mm-hmm. and the stuff that came up there was like this whole body of research around how the, the white body is kind of like um, waist up and the Japanese body is in the, in the center, in the hara, in the pelvis and the abdomen. I'm like, Oh, okay. That's interesting. And I started reading into that a little bit more because they're talking about like how white, you know, it was very kind of like semi-nationalistic writing. Right. So Mm -hmm. grain of salt there, but they're talking about the dysregulation that comes when your sense of self is higher in your body. And I was like, wait a second, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, because this is, you know somebody studying trauma. Like one of the effects of trauma is that you're you get cut off from your body. And I was like, I think this is what it's talking about. So I started researching all that and put it together like that. Um, a lot of that writing around um, somatics in Japan that talked about the differences between quote unquote East and quote unquote West was actually talking about the uh, about traumatization. When you actually look at the big picture, when you look at it through a D a decolonial lens, you start to see that like, oh, oh, they're talking about a culture being traumatized. And, you know, if you take this lens, you take this kind of nationalistic lens, that I don't think is sustainable, <laughs> but import some of those ideas into decolonial lens, what you end up with is a way to understand that like, oh, the bodies and how we're affected, like colonial, colonialism itself is an embodied process. It's a somatic process more than anything. It's not an ideological, it's not a systemic process. It's a body process. And um, that kind of gave rise to this idea of there being something that we call, um, yeah, like cultural 
complex trauma. Mm -hmm. So complex trauma, you know, is like stuff that we go through um, as a body, as like a, as a, as a person, you get developmentally affected repeatedly by something. It's not like being hit by a car. It's more like being treated badly by somebody repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And so I started to be like, wait a second. So if whiteness is trauma, there might, must, it must, it's probably this form of complex trauma. Right. Right. And that's when I started looking at the, oh, okay. So then the, for whiteness, this is not just about family pain, family origin stuff. This is actually ancestral cultural and actually a big um, piece that came in around the time. Uh, yeah. It was a conversation with a guy, Tad Hargrave, who's working on these kind of like blog posts around dear white men. I think that's what they're called. Yeah. I, I've, we I've talked been... a little bit about I, I know Tata, or sorry, I know uh, Tad a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we talked about that. And then um, I think we were talking about childhood attachment stuff. And then he mentioned something about, yeah, and then for white people, there's this abandonment from ancestral culture as parent. And I was like, oh, wait a second. So I started putting together like the colonialism as this body process and then understanding whiteness and the ancestral attachment pain, right? Mm -hmm. Connection to ancestry being a kind of attachment relation, just like a child's relationship is to their parents. That's when all the gears started turning. Mm -hmm. And so um, cultural somatic is kind of really developed around that kind of framing for me. And the original way and you would use the language would have been like to call it cultural, um, somatic therapy mm -hmm. and sometimes in closed doors cultural somatics so i was kind of like debating it around and at the time i wrote the article about whiteness as cultural complex trauma there was um um i met dare you've interviewed yeah so i mm -hmm. dare came on uh as a as a colleague and i was like oh interesting so we started doing a lot of research together and if, i think I, even a few weeks after um that article that got a lot of heat because a lot of people didn't like the idea that whiteness could be trauma behavior. Um, I, I put out a, a new blog, another blog post is called, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, what it means to heal white supremacy, restoring the cultural nervous system, cultivating Hara. So it was, a, it was distinctly about re, re, uh, rejuvenating your gut flora to heal white supremacy <laughs> but it talks about there being a cultural nervous system so that's kind of like uh, i think you know there was a big part of that pathway i think building mm -hmm. too and it was also already kind of late in, in my work at the time um but uh yeah so um so that was that was kind of the thesis is that gut healing is essential to healing white supremacy and that's still actually my 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 framing essentially when it comes down to it, it's like healing the, your internal organs is absolutely necessary part of white supremacy. Cause that's actually what white supremacy is, is cutting you culturally off from your organs. <laughs> it's mm. literally what happens in terms of like how it changes your diet, how it changes your clothes, how it changes your posture, how it changes your breathing. Um, yeah. So a lot of that uh, happened and a lot of people were uh, probably upset. I think at the time, um, yeah. who didn't really understand what was, uh, you know, felt that if we talk about whiteness as trauma, um, you know, people get to uh, get off clean. You know what I mean? Like um, that somehow they're victim. And I think this is where the, you know, your question on the complexity of call out culture and cancel culture, the idea was come out of that. Because mm -hmm. when I started seeing that whiteness is like trauma, I was like, well, I guess the carceral system to dispose of white people is not going to really do us a lot of good here. Now is it? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there I've changed a lot since, to be honest uh, in my, how I, I think at that time I was a lot more open and invested in a compassion based frames, but I think I'm a little bit less, I've moved away from that a bit now. Um, and, and a bit more of like a, a frame that's a lot more, I think I was a little bit codependent at that time with white folks still working through that piece of codependence. Mm. Now I'm in a frame a little bit more like, 
um, like be be firm, like be kind when necessary, be firm firm when necessary, be unkind when necessary. You know, mm-hmm. every everything to be appropriate uh, is a little bit more my frame now, but um, that was a big part. So a lot of people were confused, like. It's like, oh, are you are you being nice to white people? I'm like, not really. Like, people who have trauma and have power have the responsibility to look at their behavior. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know what I mean? For me, it's like really obvious. And it's like, well, if there's a problem with white people um, having so much dysregulation and that's harming people, which is obvious. Um, then uh, we need to help white people get through that. I think where I'm a bit more different now is I also think that we have a responsibility to, in general, um, to remove people or lessen the power that people hold when they have problematic behavior. So there's like a there's there's a, there's a both end kind of process of, of course, yeah, you want to support people, uh, transform, navigate, take you know, responsibility for themselves. You know, you're there to support. And you're, you, I don't, I, I think we really don't want to coddle that, like, people who don't have the capacity to hold power should, Yeah, you know? Yeah, like, right. and this yeah. Is, yeah, and this is kind of maybe comes into kind of the nuance about, um, uh, call it culture. And one of the reasons why I think, Kind of circle around. I feel like I'm like tape, dubbing over a tape or something like that. Yeah. I think you're catching me do that yeah. purposely, but I feel like better. I feel like I'm better t- able to talk about it now. Yeah. So I rather. Yeah. I, I like this. Um, is that like uh, when um, the, one of the ironies that comes out of this is that like when you're looking at a situation, I've noticed that it's actually. Uh, <laughs> there's more utility to track what we call like behaviors that generally fit under what people call personality disorder. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I say personality disorder, it means like, as opposed to like, uh, like neurodiversity and then shape. So the DSM is really bad at actually, it's weird because the DSM is kind of like saying what personality disorder is like the canon. It's like the Bible, but it's also bad at its job. So it's not very good at it right. in of itself. Um, you know, personality disorder are like behavioral sets and patterns that are inherently maladaptive in relationship. And so inherently bad when people have power, right? Duh. Like yeah, right, right. If you have, people, people have maladaptive behaviors, you don't want them to hold a lot of power in relationship. It should be very straightforward. And part of the problem with the DSM is that it starts to try to like make things like narcissism, like a, a wiring issue, a neurological issue. And I'm like, no, 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 let's not do that. That's a whole different lens. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like um, how you're wired, how you respond to stimulus is, it's like not a useful lens when you're actually trying to vet for personality patterns. So the DSM is really horrible at that. And I think it's very oppressive for that. But mm-hmm. um, So I'm just putting that as a caveat. But uh, personality disorders so like things like enmeshment uh people pleasing trauma bonding codependency uh lying compulsively uh you know grandiosity these are the things that actually we need to track rather necessarily um then like is a racist pattern happening right so uh yeah so one of the ways that this is true is let's say like um uh, let's say you have a white person, a white man in power of some organization, and they're getting called out for behaving a certain way, right? Right. So, our, um, I would say nine times out of ten, like I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> this is gonna happen, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But there's, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a, the problem with that and looking like, oh, that must be racism, right? It must be patriarchy. This is like the way that we do pattern recognition. And this is how our kind of like social industrial, social justice industrial complex has brokered the ability to read this pattern. It teaches people how people how to read this pattern, right? And people make money off of that. That's the reality, right? So uh, that's the pattern recognition system that people are selling. And nine times out of ten, I guess it's going to be accurate. But the one time out of ten that's not true, it's going to be create a lot of collateral damage, right? A lot of collateral damage, right? A huge problem here, uh, like. Yeah, 
you know, and this is my, you know, critique of me too. And a lot of things that came out of that as well is that the pattern recognition system is a little bit like, uh, it's not, that's not the pattern recognition. Like it, it, it's like, there's so many obvious pitfalls of like, let's say believing survivors outright and that like people with personality disorder patterns, it's so, it's created such an easy system for those people to hijack because once they say they are a survivor or they have a claim of somebody in power, they're automatically believed and all this like support gathers around them and they can like their behaviors are just completely, completely coddled in most cases, most scenarios. It's actually really, really tragic and frightening, frankly. Um, but again, the person like the pattern recognition system that's been sold, right. Even with me too, is like man in power, claim of harm must must have been bad yeah this is the pattern rec- yeah yeah right yeah and so what i'm saying is actually that pattern recognition system that's about patriarchy misogyny is actually weirdly not that effective at at dealing with patriarchy racism misogyny and stuff which is kind of funny and you'd think it's you think it'd be good at it but it's actually strangely ineffective at it in this bizarre way because what really matters actually um, is is to be able to look at disordered patterns, I think. And this really comes into play, let's say, when you look at uh, cases like Emmett Till, who was a black boy who was uh, lynched, and, and the claim that he whistled or flirted with a white woman, that's why he got lynched, right? Yeah. By a white mob. of And how that when you break down the story, you see that like the white woman, and this is what I tell people who are in, you know, when they're like, don't understand a critique of me too and believe survivors and all that stuff. Like that came through that era. Mm -hmm. It's like black, the black people in their experience show you that is not actually a great model. (laughs) It's like, I actually really don't think it's compatible when you look at that history. And it's like really obvious to me. It's like, you cannot use this model. Like it, like there's such a historical record of like, if you give people power and the ability to, to create false claim, to act on their hypervigilance or um, control a situation in a certain way, they do. Yeah. There's proof we've been dealing with it. And it's like, or even uh, the woman in Central Park. Yeah. 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 yeah right. Amy yeah. Cooper. Uh, imagine there's no video. Ah. Uh-huh. Imagine there was no video. Yeah. Yeah. Now what happens? Mm-hmm. Now how are we going to understand what happened? So uh, what, what's, what, so what, what pattern recognition system are you going to use to solve that? Because they're going to go into like, oh, man in park, woman must, must be assault, right? Like, do yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. or are we going to go like black man and white woman must be lying like this is yeah yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, like you see like how bad like that pattern recognition starts to get when because that tape shows you that that she was in a psychotic break essentially she was divorced from reality yeah i could see that right yeah and you can't separate i think people try to keep separating white supremacy from that kind of break from reality or these kind of disordered pattern names and the, the, the break from reality isn't bad. It's doing something, being an asshole while you're breaking from reality is the bad thing, right? Let's just yeah. be clear. But like to not understand that people don't have false claims, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> people do this all the time. Yeah, People do this all the time in our community. People lie. It's frightening. People lit- like I've had people who said things about me and I'm like literally like, wow, you just literally lied on social media about what I said or what I've done, like literally just flat out. And I have like a record of it that it's a lie. People do it anyways. Like mm-hmm. this is our behavior of the, of our community inside it. There's all, so much disorder patterning. And one of the things that happens is that a lot of this gets to survive when there is no vetting. Right. So this is a situation. Let's say Amy Cooper, there's no tape of. Yeah. Is what, what, what lens do you do? Do you, do you misogyny, racism? Like you're trying intersectional? It's probably not going to solve that. You're probably not really going to get down to the meat of it, right? Because the moment somebody says like, well, I'm on this kind of identity 
and this is what happens to me always in society, then all of a sudden they're, all their disorder patterns are protected from being exposed and being vetted. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So oh. this, this is the situation that we're Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. It's uh, There's this thing... <laughs> Um, this came up with the uprisings here in the U S and black lives matter. And in, in the wake of, uh, the murder of George Floyd, um, where you had say, uh, the, the thing that was said, and this was almost always said by white people, but I'm sure it's said by everyone, which is that we always yeah. have to defer to black leadership. So, if and they're having a street protest or or an up you know demonstration whatever it is, and there's some yeah. sense of organization, uh, we always defer to the person of color who has the yeah, who yeah. has the what megaphone. A situation of course, our narcissistic behavioral uh, pattern. What a perfect breeding ground, isn't it? Yeah, and and then you like yeah. actually talk to to white people, and the question is, do you always defer to black leadership? Always under any context or circumstance in a protest. God, no. Right. God, no. Right. Never. And it actually, no. like, but you, but you talk to a lot of white people and they say, of course, this is about them. This is their movement. This is about black life. Yeah, I know. So right. what a perfect place for whiteness as codependency or as, as like enmeshment, entanglement Yeah. to hide. But, right. But like. Perfect rock to hide underneath. Yeah. Absolutely perfect rock. Yeah. And it's. And, and the, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I just want to say it's just it's this the way you're framing this and the way you're you're approaching the subject is super clarifying because there was so I was for so long me personally I'm like I I I don't know how to I don't know how to talk about this and there is this thing where it's like you're a white man and yeah. you're not supposed to you're not supposed to critique this thing you know there is that there well, is that yeah, element yeah, of yeah, that yeah, too yeah. yeah so that's the broker's social justice industrial complex pattern recognition system that you're having to live under. Yeah. But that's actually hiding all of your behaviors. So yeah. our our community of people who really care about this shit is overrun by disorder patterning. Overrun completely. Mm. Frankly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have seen so much of it. <laughs> it's, it's 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 absolutely abhorrent. And it happens because the pattern recognitions that system that's being sold and brokered is absolutely conducive to narcissism and all kinds of disorder pattern and grandiosity. And it's so subtle because websites look great. Memes look awesome. Even like maybe half what's 90% of what somebody says. Sounds good. But when you start paying attention to the actual behavior, you're like, uh-oh. And that's the beha- that's the kind of pattern uh, recognition system people are allowed not allowed to use. Mm. Because that would be uh, oppressive and da 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 da. da. It's like no 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 no. That is the only people that benefit from us not using a personality pattern recognition system are people who are manipulating power because that's what they're doing. That's the only people that benefit because in reality, white supremacy is a personality disorder pattern, anyways. Yeah. So there's no loss. There's no loss. There's absolutely no loss there to me. Like there is no loss. Like white supremacy is narcissism. Like what what else would you call it that? Like as a culture. So there's no reason for us to use a pattern recognition system other than really a personality pattern recognition system as a foundation. There's no reason. Right. Yeah. What other reason would there be then? It's only, to be honest, frankly, a lot of it is really only because it's been brokered and people don't want it to change because their livelihood and career are standing up on these ideas that are obviously harmful. uh, And there's a lot of collateral damage that comes out of that. I have to admit that putting together this part of this episode at this point, at this juncture in it, I was thinking of how do I pivot to these various interviews that I feel or that I know in some way are connected, that there is a thread that ties them together. And like I stated throughout this part, at least once before, knowing where each part fits in this 
narrative that I'm constructing here, it's a little challenging. So I'm trying to think as I was like getting ready to bring up this next segment, I was thinking like, how do I bridge these two segments together? And it's a bit challenging because I think if there is a theme that runs through this part six, it is examining the colonial body. How do we decolonize ourselves? I think Tata has a piece of that puzzle, just as much as Matthew Remsky does, as much as Dare So Hey, as much as the people that I featured previous to that as well. In fact, there's a lot of people that I featured throughout this entire series and throughout my podcast in general that I think have insights into that. And one of the people that I really wanted to feature here, and I think that their work is incredibly valuable in discussing decolonization, is Sunil Bhatia. Sunil is a professor of human development at Connecticut College. Uh, he's the author of numerous articles relating to transnational migration, identity, and cultural psychology, and is the author of two books, including American Karma, Race, Culture, and Identity in the Indian Diaspora, and Decolonizing Psychology, Globalization, Social Justice, and Indian Youth Identities. And what I write here for this episode with Sunil is, at its root, Western psychology is colonial. With that in mind, what would a decolonized psychology include and exclude in its framework? As he addresses in his work and in this interview, psychology as a social science has served the Western colonialist project in all its forms, even as we have entered into a, quote, post-colonial period over the past century or more, the impacts of colonization on numerous populations around the world are still felt presently, profoundly so. Officially, Western nation states have abandoned previously defined colonies to self-governance after centuries of various forms of anti-colonial resistance. But the processes of an internalized colonization continue to manifest from a globalized neoliberal socioeconomic system that is structurally founded on the long-lasting legacies of colonialism and white supremacy. And I first became aware of Sunil because of an interview he did with Mad in America, and I'm going to quote here what he said from that interview. In psychology, the stories of people from the global south were depicted as a deficient form of humanity, and stories of people of color were relegated to the margins. I saw 365 million Indian youth, a gigantic part of our humanity, missing from the canon of the discipline. Their voice, their realities were erased, and I wanted to start addressing this gap. This motivated me to come up with a decolonizing framework to speak to these absences, to speak to the realities of the people who are the majority of humanity, but largely missing from the field. I think the process of decolonization is an untangling. It is an unraveling of a worldview, of a way of domination, a way of asserting ourselves on the world, both in material and psychosocial forms. So the people of the Global South, the people that exist outside of the Western world, so to speak, that have been deeply impacted by the imperialism and colonialism of the Western world, are in the process of untangling this legacy of colonialism. And we, if we exist within the colonial construct of the Western world, if we are descendants of the colonizers, then we also have to engage in that form of untangling. And I think what Sunil is pointing to in regards to decolonizing psychology, I mean, it really brings up an interesting question because if psychology as a social science has been an active agent in the colonialism that we have experienced up to the present day, then what does a psychology look like that has been decolonized? Will there be anything of psychology even left to work with? And I think this is the complex, difficult task that lies before us, because it's not about throwing everything out with the bathwater. It's a matter of untangling and figuring out what serves us and what doesn't serve us, recognizing the whole of humanity, placing ourselves within that spectrum of the human experience, and not excluding the incredible diversity of that experience. Something I've been thinking about and um, with these these massive protests and, uh, you know, there, there's calls, for instance, right now to defund the police or abolish the police. Um, there's basically an effort to dismantle the actual institutions that are perpetuating white supremacy mm -hmm. in a very mm -hmm. real sense, in the very physical lives of people, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. Um, but what is also happening is 
uh, you know, I've been I've been listening to interviews with um, uh, various people of color, uh, black individuals who are talking about how you know it's great that their white friends are being activated. They're now beginning to reflect on their own whiteness and how that impacts um, them. Um, and they talk about the very difficult situation they're in where they're like, look, we get it and we're happy that you're finally seeing it. But I mean, it's unfortunate that's taken so long and such a dramatic shift for white folks to just begin to look at themselves and how they're complicit in perpetuating this hundreds of years of, of, of colonialism, of racism, of white supremacy up to the present day. Um. But something I was thinking about in relation to your work in decolonizing psychology is that let's say that we get to this, I don't know what point you are in this process, but let's say we begin to really begin to incorporate indigenous perspectives um, and begin to actually have a decolonized psychology. Okay. Now, I imagine what would then begin to happen, and I imagine it's happening right now, is that those structures then would not be accommodating to perpetuating the colonial legacy of, of psychology mm -hmm. anymore. And in fact, what would then start happening is that the indigenizing, the decolonial psychology itself would begin to reflect on the colonizers and begin to actually see, why do you feel that you had to perpetuate this system? Why do mm -hmm. you feel like that your silence or your complicity in this was necessary? And how mm -hmm. come you didn't know anything about it? So in a way, I guess I'm asking, how can psychology in becoming decolonized can actually be reflected back at those that were the colonizers? And what does that say about the colonizers themselves? Yeah, I mean, that's a challenge. That's a that's a big question. Yeah, it is. is. <laughs> you know, that is, how do you um, dismantle? It's very similar to asking the question you asked earlier, how do you dismantle white supremacy? in a way that goes beyond activism on Facebook and, uh, uh, you know, Twitter, where you forward tweets and you, I mean, those are why are important. Um, many um, um, black activists and scholars have spoken about uh, taking very meaningful action, such as, you know, defunding um, the police, uh, and creating more spaces for multiracial solidarity where the kind of risk is shared, for example. So, so I think in a, in that same way, I would I would answer the question is I think we are far from really thinking about what a decolonized. To me, it's a verb decolonizing. So we're still in the process, uh, and we have just begun to excavate, open up this conversation. We've just uh, as more and more stories are coming out of uh, marginalized populations of what it means to be a person of color in this country, what does it mean to live under oppression, and if you're nothing else, um, what the recent movement of Black Lives Matter has really brought to forefront is the accountability that's not happened, is the, uh, mm, is, is in every branch, every area of life, uh, the um, so-called racist structures have lived and festered. So whether it's banking, um, insurance, medicine, school, housing, real estate, uh, public goods, tax and systems, they're all being um, uh, seen through the lens and enacted for white advantage. So in a similar way that that excavation is just beginning. The, uh, that top, that that so-called undoing, has been happening. It's not that it hasn't been happening. It's been happening in this in this way that's fully mobilized. Is what we have to do with also the field of psychology, not psychology, but also this whole entire social science disciplines. So to me, uh, what a colonize, a decolonized, as you said, vision of it really is to first ask a question about how did we get here. You know, what is what are the pillars? You know, we think about pillars, you know, of our society, like capitalism and a pillar, white white supremacy is a pillar, you know, in indigenous um genocide of uh indigenous people 
is one of the factors, historical um, slavery, for example. So those are um, tragic, heartbreaking, structural, um, um, institutional factors that have led to particular kinds of knowledge about self and about belief about who we are as a society. To undo that is a is what the project of decolonization really is to kind of uh, um, start with that history and to lay that bare essentially. So we first have to we have to first get to uh, what that looks like and in indigenous uh, you know cultures and indigenous uh, in, um, uh, societies where there are there is a, a movement afoot to reclaim that reclaim storytelling, reclaim myths, reclaim ideas about healing, mental health, um, reclaim uh, land, reclaim water, reclaim rights, uh, reclaim, you know, you can never get back to maybe the pre-colonial space that we think about that was pure or that we think about in our mind that doesn't sort of exist. We have, there it has layers of modernity, post-colonialism, globalization, neoliberalism. But there are ways in which we we can undo it by first asking this question about the question of what we call, what I would call two reckonings, the reckoning with history and then the reckoning with the present moment and seeing what are the connections between that. So that to me would be one of the projects to begin with. And second, we have to ask ourselves is, do we even want to call this psychology or why call it psychology? So what can emerge from it as many meaningful voices will speak to it uh, is to first do the, uh, to really look at the, not just the colonial legacy, but the ways in which uh, whiteness, white supremacy, white ideas uh, of the modern subject of the family of self, of who we are, is projected through those sets of practices, historical. So that project is going on, but it's small. I think that needs to be bigger. So once we have a very good idea of what got us here, then we can really think about um, what a decolonized you know, psychology uh, would look like. And in that, I think you've already pointed to some of the threads. One is an interrogation, one is the self-reflexivity, of course, but other is to think about viable spaces where there's not just one indigenous psychology, there are many across many nations, many tribes, many parts of the world, what we call the global south, people are asking all these questions and trying to come up with going back into history, going back into uh, history, which is also concerning not just tradition, not just uh, uh, fragments of uh, ideas about the good life and the religion and so on. It's also really spe specifically asking questions about social inequality. So one way in which I have argued for looking at decolonized psychology is not just about the mind, but also looking at how the mind is shaped with structures of inequality. So one project of a decolonized psychology would be to look at chronic hunger, to look at unemployment, to look at 2.5 billion people who live in extreme poverty and deprivation, to look at how, for example, both COVID, the pandemic, has laid bare the pre-existing condition of racial inequality, but also global inequality. I said, those are all, I would say, questions of the mind because they're connected to questions of, of environment, questions of culture, questions of structures. If we, if we divorce the mind as somehow separate from these structures, then you get a psychology that's apolitical, historical, and very empty. What decolonizing psychology is to kind of remind ourselves is that we are shaped and embedded in these structures. And, and a decolonizing psychology then sort of speaks to what those structures are. Right? You know, one is of course capitalism, the other is racism. So those would be, I would say, two very important pillars, themes, which would be very pivotal to looking at what a decolonized psychology would look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just have to just remark that it is, um, it is that 
that to be, I guess, to decolonize psychology may be to actually dismantle, like, we may not even have psychology in the sense that we've understand it, right. understood it to right. be. I mean, you might actually be deconstructing something mm. completely right. <laughs> right. in a very real right. sense. Right. And I, I think... Mean, it, it, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's got to freak out some of your colleagues. That's got to freak out some of the folks that are like, but this is objective and we're standing outside. Like, there's this... And that's kind of the problem is it's not that it's it's I think it it challenges some of the deepest assumptions that we have about the Western mm. perspective, the Western project and, and what it's tied up with. It's right. Right. I mean, that's one. And also sort of how does the West live in the global South? What forms it has taken there? It's not that the West doesn't live there. You know, that's what colonialism, Western colonialism does. It 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 leaves its footprint in the minds, you know, as, as one pioneering Indian um, psychologist sp speaks about the second colonization, the colonization of the mind where we are still, where, where the colonizers gave us the terms and conditions in which we have lived our life for centuries. Those terms and conditions don't evaporate when the flag, the new flag comes up and the old flag goes down. The, those terms and conditions continue to flourish in some ways because those, you know, we change them, but they still are very present in our life. And whether it's in parts of Africa, whether it's parts of Asia, but I think it's it's important to 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 kind of think about is that while in some ways the legacies of colonialism, physical may be over in parts of Asia and Africa, they're not over. That's what we call it settler colonialism as distinct in the United States in places like Australia and New Zealand where indigenous scholars have asked us about continuously questions about what does it mean to unsettle the settler colonial state? You know, so when you're asking the question, I mean, there is, the, and there, I think, um, many scholars who work in the field of indigenous psychology also ask this question and also create this body of knowledge that may not necessarily be fit within the structures of psychology they have, we have right now. So it will be, you know, um, like think about intergenerational storytelling, oral storytelling, think about the lessons and the wisdom in our myths, in, in our origin stories for so many different cultures, think about, um, you know, we think about mindfulness as one, but, you know, the power of mindfulness and, and mindfulness is not what the word was used. It was, as I pointed out in the Mad in America uh, podcast, it was, it was, it was Vipassana meditation. You know, there was specifically insight meditation that's been going on for 2,500 years which really dealt with the question of the mind as such. That is, how do you, how, how do you not suffer was a big question, you know, for Buddha and, and, and that, got, that got laced into Hinduism, into Jainism, into Buddhism, which became Buddhism. But those are questions about impermanence, about suffering or Dukkha, Dukkha is in suffering. Those are concepts have been around for 2,500 years. They are a psychology because these were individuals who are dealing with what does it mean to be liberated from suffering? What does it mean to live a life that is not particularly attached to material pursuits? What does it mean to sacrifice? What does it mean to do duty? It was there in Chinese philosophy. You can see semblances of it in Egyptian philosophy, Persian philosophy. So to me, those are all parts of what I would call a psychology that needs to be built or revisited, not necessarily relegated to philosophy or religion as such. Um, so that will be another really important ways in which we can think about uh, the larger project of psychology. Okay. So like expanding the boundaries, rethinking what, what that means. So there's another thread that I want to pull on here, and this ties into something that, I mean, it's already a lot of these interviews have dealt with things that are very personal for me, ways in which I've tried to understand aspects of myself through 
the works of others because I feel like my experience is not my own. It's actually the experience of many others. I have, through this work, have talked to plenty of listeners of the podcast who have said, yeah, I'm really glad that I found your podcast because now I don't feel as alone in my experiences. I can kind of feel like there's at least others out there that understand uh, what it's like to live in this time to put a name to it or to define it in a very particular way. To say comforting, it's, it's not quite the right word, but there is a sense of solidarity in that. I personally have felt very depressed uh, throughout many periods of my life. I've struggled with forms of depression, dissociation, uh, anxiety. I've never been officially diagnosed. I think one time I went to an actual doctor when I was a teenager, when I was really deep into a depression and the doctor, like the, without any hesitation, just recommended that I get some kind of SSRI or some other kind of pharmaceutical drug to just balance out my brain chemicals. In that experience, I remember that experience of feeling like that isn't it, dude. <laughs> there's something, there's something that you're not addressing here. And then as I got a little older and as I began to do this work, I mean, the depression still would come and go, but. Uh, I began to, you know, understand it within the larger context of the time and place that we are in. Now, I'm not here to say that for those that do take antidepressants or other pharmaceutical drugs to deal with their depression or their anxiety, I'm not saying that that's the wrong thing to do to each their own, but I do think that they are overprescribed, and I do think that we have to examine on some level the material conditions in which we are born under and born into that plays a huge role in the experiences that we have in our formative years and uh, into our adult lives. And so uh, one of the threads I want to pull on here is depression. Because psychology tends to individualize our psychological experiences. And through the previous interviews that I've featured so far, I think it's apparent that we are children of history, that we are children of ruptures that occurred hundreds of years ago and that are still being felt up to the present day. And so to examine the present moment, I had an interview with an individual named Mikkel Kraus Franzen. He is the author of Going Nowhere Slow, The Aesthetics and Politics of Depression. In this interview with him, we discussed depression, capitalist realism, and revolution, as was discussed in his essay, A Future with No Future, Depression, the Left, and the Politics of Mental Health, that was published at Los Angeles Review of Books. Uh, to quote from that article, an adequate diagnosis of depression and its context is not enough in and of itself. It is common wisdom, however, that the diagnosis does not necessarily entail the cure. Just because we know what's wrong doesn't mean we will be able to deal with it. On the contrary, one of the primary symptoms of depression is that what you need to do is precisely what you cannot do, at least not alone and on your own. Or in the plain words of Anne Kvetkovich, saying that capitalism or colonialism or racism is the problem does not help me get up in the morning. Also, there is no reason to believe that abolishing private property ownership or realizing a global and absolute cancellation of private debt will relieve the suffering of depressed people with a single stroke as if by magic. But in an act of speculation, I am tempted to say that revolution is the best antidepressant there is. It makes for a better world, true happiness. But alas, in order to do revolution, we need to get out of bed. A real dialectical catch-22 of depression. Yeah, in, in, your, uh, in your essay, uh, you reference Mark Fisher quite a bit. And um, yeah. tragically, he committed suicide a few years ago, uh, you know, battling depression. And he wrote extensively on his own depression and politics, talking about capitalism. And he has a very famous book, which addresses this called Capitalist Realism. And I see mm. it referenced a lot. And you, you really get into it in this essay. So let's try to get into this idea, because I think what you're trying to point to is the, the, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Because uh, I've been in deep depression and, and I felt I really related with how you described this feeling of um, being stuck, being like in a hole. There's no future. Uh, there's only the kind of um, painful present, if that, yeah. or a numbness, too. It gets to a point mm -hmm. of numbness. Um, and in a way, you, capitalism 
as it's being sort of served up to us today is that this is like the end of history. Like this is the best possible system. We're not going to proceed or go any further from that. This is it. And you draw Mm -hmm. those parallels between the two. So I guess just to ask this question of when you explore capitalist realism, what is that exactly? And how does that fit into your understanding of depression in general? Mm. Right. Um, Let me first of all uh, start by saying that what I really like about the work of Mark Fisher is that he's really excellent in combining his personal experiences with depression, with a political uh, um, um, understanding of it. Um, Whereas there are some uh, leftist critics and who do similar diagnosis of of contemporary society and its various um, pathologies, but they don't have the acute and very intimate um, um, understanding of what kind of hell it can be to be depressed, for instance. So I really, you know, think that is important to take seriously um, the experiences of, you know, depressed people. Uh, and I think he's very good at that. But he's also very good at, at combining those personal pathologies or problems with a more general um, analysis of the capitalist society that we've been living in uh, since, I would say, the early 70s. Um, and capitalism or um, capitalist realism to him uh, names <coughs> the rather widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable economic and political system, but it's also impossible to even imagine um, 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 imagine any kind of alternative to it. And he calls this a special kind of realism, right? And and what he says is that the realism of depressed people is pretty similar, or it resonates with that uh, capitalist realism, um, where, as you also said before, you, you can really imagine any kind of future, any kind of alternative to the present, which is basically hell on earth. You are just suffering uh, immensely, and it seems um, internally. Um, So I think, I mean, that kind of connection there, but also the kind of connection between the brutal levels of (coughs) inequality, violence, uh, class differences. um, Sorry, I I kind of lost the thread here, but I'm... I'm, (laughs) Okay. um, but I mean, it's pretty well documented, not by Mike Fisher, but by other scientists, that there is a very causal connection between people who are indebted or people who are poor and the risk of experiencing or exhibiting various kinds of mental illnesses. Uh, so, for instance, if you are in, in debt, uh, you're much more likely to suffer from depression, for instance, or if you are poor you are three times as likely uh, to to suffer from depression. Uh, so <coughs> contrary to a lot of mainstream psychology, psychology, psychiatry, but also the diagnostic uh, manuals uh, that the doctors are, are using, we have actually a lot of context and a lot of uh, causal connections to consider when dealing with depression. Uh, which should uh, push us in 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 the direction of um, viewing depression um, in a historical, political, economic context, um, which uh, the di- which the diagnostic manuals certainly do not do. Uh, they only look at symptoms without any regard for the context um, or the causal links between. Uh, the, the symptoms of, of depression and your, I don't know, your life situation, your job or your joblessness, um, whatever that might be. Right. Yeah. You know, I think what really uh, attracted me to want to talk to you and everything was reading your essay and feeling, uh, having these memories come up because I, I'm now 31. I remember in my early, I, in high school when I was in my teenage years and then in my early 20s, I suffered from pretty severe depression, you know, that what you talk about, you know, not even being able to get out of bed, that kind of a thing. Yeah. 
And I recall going to some kind of therapist and trying to express what I was going through. Uh, and I was even, I was like saying like, look, I mean, everything as far as I can tell is going to shit here. Uh, yeah. And I don't really see a future, not just for myself, but for our species as a whole. You know, I could see the writing on the wall. And, you know, short term incentives just weren't appealing uh, to me at all. And trying to convey this idea to this this poor woman, <laughs> she mm. only her only response was to try to get me to think more positively, to try to change mm. my thinking patterns my thought patterns so that I had more of a positive outlook on life that all it really came down to is that my psychology wasn't good, that I wasn't thinking correctly yeah. in a sense. She didn't say that, but that's, that's basically what she was pointing to. And I remember actually it made me feel even more ang like almost a mixture of anger and resentment and, and depression, you know, a deeper sense of depression kind of, that's what it led to. Um, yeah. Speaking to that, I mean, I think that within neoliberal capitalism, everything gets reduced to the individual. Everything becomes personalized and it doesn't address, as you said, doesn't address the society. It's like the society doesn't no. exist. Uh, it's, you know, kind of, it, 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 it's, it's strange because it seems like we're all members of this thing, but for some reason it's just not addressed. And so, I mean, maybe this is something you've personally experienced or this is something you, you've you just maybe analyzed or maybe a little bit of both, but the ways in which neoliberalism or capitalist realism, as Fisher says, uh, kind of reinforces this idea that, no, this is, the, this is as good as it's going to get and you're kind of crazy for not thinking that it's good, you know? What does that mean? Yeah. I mean... I've definitely experienced it or come across it on both levels. I mean, I've experienced it personally, sitting in therapy, try, talking to a psychologist who means well, but who is unable, utterly unable to address the problem at stake um, in political terms, basically. Um, so even if psychologists, are, I mean, most psychologists are not saying to you directly that it's all on you, that it's all your fault, right? I mean, sure. there is still this widespread message floating around, um, sometimes even explicitly so, where therapists or self-help gurus or psychologists are basically saying to people and to depressed people, especially, get over it or man up or it's your own fault and it's your own responsibility to be happy but that also means that it's your own responsibility if you are not happy if you are unhappy if you are depressed or stressed out or anxious or burned out um so we have that very dominant tendency um uh, to be met with this uh, personalization privatization of mental illnesses in general um where it's all about you your own self, your own mindset, your own brain, your own thoughts. And the idea is that you can't really change society, right? You can't do that, obviously, apparently. So what you can change is yourself. What you can change is your own thoughts. And these thought, thoughts can change your, you know, personal reality is the idea. Um, <clears throat> and also, I mean, the whole domain of positive psychology, the main and vision is uh, to help people become better versions of themselves. It is to help people become more productive and, you know, positive workers or citizens. It is, the goal is to keep the wheels turning, basically, uh, to get people back to the jobs that perhaps made them sick in the first place. Um, right. Yeah. And there is this uh, sentence from a uh, um, Kathy Acker that has just been um, echoing in my mind for the last couple of years where she says in one of her books, I think it's from the late 70s, that we couldn't change the system. So we, what we tried to do was change ourselves. And I mean, there is this strange parallel between that message and the message of 
neoliberalism, the message of positive psychology, and of course also the ideology of happiness. I mean, um, I don't know if you know the concept of the happiness pie. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't. Uh, which is a concept that this um, woman called, and I think I may bungle her name, but she's called something like Sonia Lyubominsky or s something like that. And she says that, okay, we need to um, imagine that happiness <coughs> is a pie, right? And 40% um, uh, of your own happiness is determined by the genes, or maybe 50%, 50%, I think. And then 40%, uh, and, and then 10% is uh, circumstances, and then 40% is your intentional activities, I think she calls it, which means that 40% is basically up to you. It's up to your own choices, your own thoughts, your own mindset, your own lifestyle, etc. And that is, of course, the, the message just that she is trying to convey alongside um, maybe the most um, influential thinker in Scarecrow within that tradition, um, Martin Seligman, uh, who, who has also written a lot about happiness and, and positive psychology, the science, so-called, of positive psychology. And the whole idea is that responsibility, as some critics have called it, responsibility is insourced in a way. Responsibility is, you know, all on you. Um, I, 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 I'm, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious what's wrong with this kind of, you know, logic. Right. If, if we can even call it that. So as we get to the latter several interviews here of this part six, I am acknowledging something and how this is progressing, which is that as in that previous part, talking about depression, about capitalist realism and all of this, when I talk about in this part about detangling the colonial body, this process of decolonization, as we unravel this and begin to separate and understand and interrogate these parts of ourselves, we can look at the, the broad scope of history, we can look at the broad scope of this colonial project that we have been born into, and becoming conscious of that is one level, but that then needs to be applied to ourselves as individuals. Because as much as we are connected to the collective, the collective can't really be changed or can't really move in a different direction or begin to heal these patterns of trauma, dissociation, narcissism, and all the various aspects of this culture. We cannot begin to address those things unless we see those within ourselves as well and see ourselves as not being separate. As discussed in the previous part, discussing depression is an all too common experience that people have. And for me, I think it's a part of the journey a little bit. I, I don't know how anyone can live in this time and in this place right now and not feel overwhelmed or saddened or depressed or anxious about any of this. And so I think that this process of, again, I'm using the word decolonization, but there's different terms or ways in which we can understand what is happening here. When we begin this process of examining these things, peeling back the layers inevitably reveals aspects of our individual selves that we may feel shame about, that may be tied up in forms of privilege. And to me, privilege, as I've come to understand it more and more, whether we're talking about it through a white privilege lens or the male privilege lens, which I benefit from both, or I experience both at least, that when that is challenged or when there are instances where you really have to look at these things and examine how it informs your behaviors. And and it's not just on the broad, like how you interact in the world economically and socially and materially, but it's also in some of the most intimate relationships you have is when these subjects really come up. When you have a partner or somebody that you're intimate with, and they're also carrying their own personal experiences, their own personal wounds into the relationship. And it is in that process of building an intimate, trusting relationship with somebody that these aspects, these elements of the culture that you're born into, that you have been encultured in, begin to really like show up. And, and in this turn that I'm going to be taking here with this part six, 
we're going to be talking about gender a bit. We're going to be talking about masculinity and also how that intersects with whiteness. Of course, we've talked about whiteness quite a bit already. So the next person that I will be featuring here was an interview that was actually quite personal. And I hoped, and I think it seems that it was this way, at least that in producing this episode with him, that other folks also could relate to the experience that I was having at that time, and I still continue to have. And that individual that I interviewed was Anthony Rella, or Tony Rella. Uh, He's a psychotherapist, writer, and witch. Uh, What I wrote for this episode was, much of this discussion with Anthony touches on some very personal topics that I'm presently reflecting on and addressing in my own life. This includes personal reflections on intergenerational and collective trauma, somatic responses to conflict in intimate relationships, masculinity, privilege, and our own individual and collective responses to the overlapping crises we are in in the midst of contemporarily. In conducting this interview, I attempted to present my inquiries into these subjects with openness and vulnerability, while also keeping our explorations broad enough to be received by practically anyone that is receptive to these subjects. This segment of Anthony's essay, It is Right to Take Time to Grieve, expresses some of what we explore in this discussion. Grief and disappointment are not separate from care, joy, and enthusiasm. All of these feelings are emotions of engagement with this life. Letting things matter to us, taking risks, opening our hearts, asking for what we really want and need, and then getting it, or not getting it, or getting it in a way we didn't want or expect, or getting it in a way that kind of fucks up the whole enjoyment of it. Should I turn myself away from my sorrow, grief, and disappointment of not getting then it remains in me. The space and energy I would have for fresh caring and new daring remains occupied. These feelings begin to become stagnant, shifting into cynicism, pessimism, despair, and irritability. Life no longer seems worth the effort of caring. I guess I'm curious about, because in in researching your work and going into your writings, I mean, you've written about privilege. Um... Uh, you had an, it was, I think it was published a few years ago, but the anger of white men and a lot Mm -hmm. of it's very personal. It's about you reflecting on your own experiences with this, but you know, something I've been thinking about is not only with white supremacy and privilege that comes with that system, but also masculinity being a, you know, a, a man, I guess you could say, uh, you know, there, there is obviously privileges that come with being white and being a man. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is we tend to not think about how that privilege, obviously that it oppresses people and those people are traumatized and, and made, you know, and they're, they're oppressed by that. But I think it cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I think that that's, what's fascinating. I think that this crisis and whatever crises come about after this are going to point to that underlying trauma that comes with being a part of a privileged group of people because all of your privileges and assumptions are challenged in those times. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the role that trauma plays in privilege. Hmm. That's a pretty open question, but I'm just kind of fishing for, for thoughts. <laughs> your thoughts on that. It's, it's open and it's a, it's a dangerous question uh, because it's, <laughs> it's a very nuanced question. Yeah. And any, any sentence I say out of context could probably be misconstrued to a position that's not accurate. And it's something that I, it's something I reflect on a lot. It's something I work on with my clients and it's a it's a kind of an ongoing reflection. So, um, but I do. There is a truth to that, and one of the things that one of the things I I observe in myself and, and my clients when we're working on issues of of privilege is that there's something about there's something about privilege that is kind of dehumanizing in a in a different way than oppression is dehumanizing. Like they're both dehumanizing. They both kind of reduce us to certain attributes. They don't, they don't allow us to be full humans. And, and when you're privileged, you get, you get certain like perks for sort of submit surrendering your humanity to that, that system. But there's also kind of a, 
this shell or not shell, this core of like shame and that that seems to be at the center of, of privilege and like that there's this essential belief that you are this bad, unworthy person um, and you've just got to go along with whatever these expectations are. You've got to, to prove that you're a worthy person. Um, masculinity is a, a particularly good example um, because there's been you know research um, that if you kind of are talking to uh, uh, a cis man and you imply he's not manly enough, it tends to engender these like really stupid, like acting out behaviors of where he's like trying to prove that he's a man um, and taking risks and doing dangerous stuff. And so it really kind of gets men to do things that are dangerous to themselves just to kind of prove that they fit this category that's supposed to be essential to who they are. Like, like one vein of thinking is that as a man, you're just a man and blah, blah, blah. But, but we all know, I think I would say we all know, certainly everyone who grows up as a man knows that that's always conditional, that that can always be threatened or challenged or taken away. And I think that that is the double bind of privilege where, um, you are, you are afforded this status as long as you are accepted and you fit these norms and you, you have the cost of that is, is all these parts of your humanity that get projected onto oppressed people. So like if you do any of these activities, then you're gay and being gay is not, not in the same bucket as man or whatever. And so, so then it becomes something like I can't recycle because recycling makes me gay. Like, it's just like that kind of thinking. Um, so, so that's a big piece of it. And also I think that obviously informs fragility, uh, when people can't tolerate conversations about whiteness or masculinity and privilege, um, it brings up those feelings of shame and unworthiness and something that I, I notice a lot and have been, I've been kind of thinking about my language around this, but I, I notice it particularly in white men, I don't think it's restricted to white men, but it's like there's this sort of specter of shame that adds all this commentary to, to feedback. So if somebody says, you know, you're taking up too much space in this conversation, then, then there's this like internal thing that gets added where it becomes like, oh, well, I'm just not allowed to say anything then. Or like that person said, like that joke really hurt my feelings or that joke is really offensive. Then they're like, well, I just can't tell a joke then. And like, you can, you know, it just becomes this totalizing thing that's really ridiculous because it's, it, it's like this, it's heard as confirming this essential sense of unworthiness, which then many people react to that feeling of shame and unworthiness by then trying to, to, to shut the other person up, to like make the other person stop doing whatever's, whatever's bringing up that feeling. But it's not the other person doing that. It's this internalized feeling of shame and unworthiness that we didn't necessarily choose, but we got to take responsibility for ourselves. Like I've got to learn to be with my own feelings of shame. I've got to learn how to discern what is this person actually saying to me? And like, what's all my shit? What's all my stuff that is actually making this relationship harder? Because if I were able to set aside my shame and just listen to this other person, I might realize that what they're saying is not that like irrational. It's actually a pretty like reasonable thing to ask. Um, I would make their lives a lot easier. And then I would also kind of see that I get to be a human like just because I made a joke that this person's hurt by doesn't mean this horrible thing happened that I have to go like throw myself into the river. It's just they're letting me know. And it's actually they're inviting intimacy and connection by communicating something about themselves if I'm able to hear it. Uh, but I think a lot of that's the other side of privilege is that um, not only is it emotion, does it require emotional effort to do that inner work? Um, most people aren't motivated to do that because, um, their lives are set up where they don't have to, they don't have to, yeah. um, 
to be frank. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, this, this is a personal thing with myself, but, um, so I want to acknowledge that we're both men, uh, Mm -hmm. and we're both white. So Mm -hmm. we're having a conversation. I think it's been a good, but I just want to acknowledge that because it's worth saying, but something that I've been part, part of the reason why I've been seeking therapy of some kind, um, is because, you know, I, it's interesting. I, I've had, uh, instances where many times, I guess, um, where, uh, I can talk as much as I want about masculinity and privilege and all of these different things. But when, uh, certain behaviors that are, or things that I've said or done, that's been called out and been like, Hey, this is actually a part of this problem mm-hmm. uh, of, 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 uh, of male privilege or, or whatever it is, my reaction is my reaction has been, I'm not like those other people. I'm not like other men that do that because I realized that I was building this um, image of myself, this idea of myself as being different from um, yeah. separate from mm-hmm. these things that exist and have been normalized in the culture at large. In fact, what I think would say specifically in us American culture is, is kind of the base, uh, what it was built upon. And so, so much of my own like reaction has been from a place of like, wait, don't you see me as being different or better Mm -hmm. than Mm -hmm. those things? But when Mm -hmm. it's actually being spoken to and acknowledged by somebody else that I care about, they're not saying it to put me down. They're just saying like, this is kind of a problem and you should, think about that so it's kind of interesting because um i think especially for people that at least understand these concepts of privilege like you've discussed it's another level to it's a completely different thing to actually um to to put to internalize that to to address those internal behavior patterns that we have Mm -hmm. like that i see in myself Mm -hmm. and you know that that's been much of this the guess the the issues I've had lately is like, how do I proceed? How do I work with that? How do I move forward? I've, I've had weeks and weeks of just being like, I don't know what to do with Mm -hmm. that. You know, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's not really, I'm not sure if there's a good question in there for you, but it's something just that I've observed in myself and I just wanted to speak to. Yeah. It's a good observation. And I think it's kind of um, it's another facet of, of whiteness that uh, and shame that we kind of uh, a lot of white people when we are uh, really early into internalizing these um, values and beliefs and unpacking is it becomes like part of a way that we that we deal with shame is by becoming like the good person because shame says I'm really bad like. I'm really bad. And so then I have to prove that I'm good so that I don't have to be bad, except shame is an inner feeling of badness. It's, you know, maybe it was put in, it was probably, it was put in by experiences we had with other people, but at some point, um, we have to take responsibility ourselves to heal our own shame. Like really nobody can do it for us. Um, but until we get to that point, uh, we try to control other people and, make it so that they don't see us in a way that we feel shame about. And so one way that shows up is like, I'm going to be the good, whatever. And so a lot of people, when I, when we're internalizing anti-racist values or, you know, um, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, anti-oppression work, we kind of internalize it in this sort of intellectual moralizing way where it's like, I know the right things to say. And so I'm not like those other white people Um, and you can't say that white person because that's bad. And it kind of takes on that moralizing, shaming flavor. Um, and that, um, that really, I, I, I think it's unhelpful. I find it unhelpful because it becomes uh, another way of avoiding what you're saying, doing my own emotional work and my own work of, um, 
deepening into myself and tolerating my feelings and uh, becoming less fragile and really accepting that that these these things are true about me that um, I'm no different than this other white person uh, in terms of we're both shaped and benefit from white supremacy and we are we are having different ways of engaging with that and for me it's it's continues to be a work in progress and you know i i it's it's kind of intentionally plunging yourself into those waters of just sitting with the discomfort of of feeling that shame and feeling guilt and not making other people wrong for it but really trying to listen to um both what's being communicated to me and then what my experience is like. Um, and so, you know, for me, uh, as a therapist, you know, I have one way of dealing with that, which is, uh, I think one of many approaches, uh, and a lot of it, a lot of it just is about learning to be friendly with our feelings and to, um, just start doing the inner work of accepting all of my feelings and trying to set aside the labels of whether a feeling is, is good or bad. Um, I, in my practice, I try to kind of set aside good and bad entirely as labels because they're, they're, they're not really that helpful. They kind of, um, they really get in the way of nuance and experience and, and they, they're just not helpful. Uh, they're not accurate. Uh, to say something feels good doesn't really tell me a whole lot. And to say something feels bad doesn't tell me a whole lot. Uh, because I don't know what good or bad means to you. And also not all like uncomfortable or unpleasant feelings are bad. In fact, many of them are deeply necessary, important. And if we can learn to feel them, it's quite healing. So kind of going back to what we're talking about with grief, you know, some people say sadness is a bad feeling and some people say anger is a bad feeling. But if I don't have access to both those feelings, then I, I can't do that work of grieving my losses, letting go of the old ways. And if I can't do that, then I then I, I can't do the work of envisioning something new or adapting to my new circumstances. And so there's uh, a lot of my work is about trying to set aside the mental labels of good or bad and really starting with what, what am I noticing? Just that simple question of what am I noticing? Um, this person is saying something to me or I'm reading this article and I'm noticing I'm having a strong reaction. And is it possible to take a step back and take a deep breath and just, just, on a very descriptive way, I'm noticing uh, my heart's racing. I'm noticing my stomach feels really tight. I'm noticing I'm feeling shaky and then just kind of hanging out with that. And like, what else do I notice about that? Like what thoughts am I having? What, what beliefs are coming up? What memories, what story am I telling about what's happening? And just trying to be present with it, but not in it, not like identified with it. And just, just that, if you can just do that, that's, that's huge that you learn a lot about yourself. Uh, you learn a lot about your inner world and what you're bringing to this interaction. When I had recorded that interview with Tony, I was doing a lot of the work that was mentioned in that interview with him. Uh, a lot of this work around shame, around privilege, and I think that this ultimately is a part of the work that we do in our time that we have on this planet. I, I've joked, half joked, I guess. You grow up and you get into the age that I'm in currently, which is in my early 30s. And you think you, you know, you reach adulthood and you reach this certain level of maturation. And as you get to this point in your life, you begin then the process of unlearning a lot of the things that you have been conditioned to understand and uh, experience the world through. And I think that is a huge part of decolonization. That is a huge part of coming to terms with intergenerational patterns, addressing those cultural somas or those non-corporal bodies that possess us, that 
inform our behavior within our most intimate relationships. I think it's extremely important that as we reach certain points in our life that we have these moments of deep reflection. I think we have this idea that once we start to understand certain things on this deeper level, that there's this almost, you you wake up and there's this enlightenment. And I think what is true about that is that I don't know if there is such a thing as true enlightenment, but whatever enlightenment is, if there is such a thing, it is not this joyous experience. I, I think that there is a sense of peace that can come with it. But it is to recognize your role in all of this and that we are incredibly complex figures that contain multitudes. And so part of overcoming one of the things that I think inhibits our growth as individuals, uh, one of the things is to address where that shame comes from. That is something that I'm continually working with. In one area that I work with this feeling of shame particularly within intimate relationships, is issues around masculinity. Now, I, being a cisgendered heterosexual male, carry a certain privilege because I think it's not necessarily going to inhibit my ability to make decisions and to move through the world. I think, though, that regardless of whether you're a cis heterosexual person, whether you're a white person, whether you're any of these categories that obviously are indicative of a system that is built around these identities, right? This idea that you fit into these categories neatly. I think ultimately we're incredibly beautiful, nuanced, complex creatures, and that the process of colonization and all of the other systems that emerge out of that process is to cut off parts of ourselves that ultimately then somehow serve some kind of social paradigm that colonization has produced. And people have been resisting that for a very long time in all the different ways that they have. And there's two more interviews that I would like to feature before we conclude this. And the next one that I would like to feature deals with this subject around gender and what she describes as the majoritarian reality using the metaphor of an ice flow. And that person is Margaret Kiljoy. She is a prolific musician. She's a novelist, a writer. She writes a little bit of nonfiction and essays, but most of her writing is fiction. She's the author of numerous books, including The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion and The Barrel Will Send What It May. And some of her music projects include Vulgarite, Feminazgul, al Sarath, and Nomadic War Machine. And as she states in her bio, I spent most of my adult life on the road and am currently nestled into the Appalachian Mountains. Politically, I'm an anarchist. I believe society would be better off without systems of hierarchy and oppression, such as the state capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and the like. I'm a trans woman, and my preferred pronouns are she, her, but I also believe in the abolition of gendered language and have no problem with people using the singular they to refer to me. Now, the section that I'm going to be featuring here, we talk about an essay that she had published at that time titled Art in the Void, in which she explores creativity and artistic exploration using the metaphor of an ice flow floating in an infinite sea to examine our mutually expressed and shared reality and our contributions to it. To quote from that essay, We, more or less all of us, live on the ice flow. We, more or less all of us, are constantly in the process of making and fixing and expanding it. Within our continued work, the ice would break apart or it would melt, and we would be swallowed by the sea, by the void, by the infinite possibility. That is to say, we are constantly in the process of making and remaking reality. We do not do this alone. We do this collectively. And so within that framing, we discuss not only creative expression as such, but also gender roles and other potentially constricting categories our society imposes on us. And that's really the point of this section, is to navigate that tricky territory how I think through this process of colonizing our bodies that expressions such as gender become incredibly rigid and that nobody benefits from that. Well, I'm going to try to tie this into uh, a recent essay you published uh, on your website. The title of that is Art in the Void. And I think discussing anarchism and, and anarchists in particular, I think I think this maybe fits into the metaphor or analogy that you use in this essay about the ice flow of reality. Um, And I mean, in the context of your essay, it's 
regarding art and creativity and expression and and our kind of uh, you actually I wanted to ask you about this in particular you you use a very specific term for the reality that we are collectively engaging in and participating mm-hmm. in you you say it would be nice if we had a consensus reality but we don't we have a I think you use a term majoritarian reality um, so I would ask uh, if you could talk about that metaphor you use of us living uh, of reality being an ice flow. Uh, I think it was a really beautiful and very elegant way to describe this. Um, and if you could describe maybe the difference between uh, what you think consensus reality is versus majoritarian reality. Oh, interesting. I, I hadn't actually, you know, it's funny because I wasn't thinking about anarchism specifically when I was writing that, but of course it it bleeds into it because, you know, that that is a framework by which I see the world. Um, so... I present this metaphor in the, in that that essay you mentioned, Art in the Void, uh, that reality is something that we collectively create. The ideas of what constitute you know, social norms, uh, all all kinds of things, and I, I it's possible down to the actual like sort of quantum physics level, but I don't want to specifically <laughs> bet on. But there's a lot of things that are clearly social constructs that have real impacts upon our life. Like, obviously, gender is the one that gets talked about the most right now. What is and isn't a a man or a woman or a non-binary person or whatever. These are socially constructed, and they've been different in different societies with different impacts on people's lived realities in different cultures throughout time. Like, the current framework of transness that I, I largely fit within as a trans woman looked entirely different in, say, medieval England, where the best research I can find says that I would have been called a, a badling. Um, I would have been one of the baden. Ba- badling? Yeah, B-A-E-D-L-I-N-G, badling. Mm. Uh, someone who is a man who pretends to be a woman, essentially. Pretends? Yet, is that the key word, pretends? I don't, that? you know, I don't know. I have a hard time finding it because it actually seems like Legally speaking, we were a third gender, mm. unfortunately, because we were criminalized. But because there, in the laws about badlings, it says if a badling has sex with a man, it's one crime. If a badling has sex with a woman, it's a different crime. And if a badling has sex with another badling, it's a third, it's, you know, third category. <laughs> okay. No, so it no wasn't, sex it was, for the badlings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and I kind of I, I like to believe that if there if there was a Badling culture, it probably built up in the fact that there wasn't really that much central government going on in a lot of parts of um, Dark Ages sure. Europe, sure. Um, or England in particular, as we're talking about this. So probably Badlings were running around doing their own thing perfectly fine, and then at some point someone wrote down a law saying that we couldn't anymore. But it was a different concept than modern transness because. Presumably, hormones weren't available. I don't know whether people attempted DIY surgery or, you know, or anything like that. And then, if you look throughout history and including in a lot of modern cultures, there's all kinds of third and multiple genders that map really roughly to modern transness. But it's a, a Western concept to assume that the the modern Western concept of transness applies to all of these people. Like, like I am not, um, uh, I'm not two spirit, which is a, a conception that is, um, uh, shared by a large portion of indigenous populations of North America that represents other ideas of gender. But because that's not my culture, I, I am not that. And it is a different thing than being a trans woman. So I guess, but to to make a more a more obvious comparison about um, social construction, Europe and Asia are different continents. And I remember as a kid looking at a map and being like, "That doesn't make any sense." And because what is a continent, this ostensibly objective scientific framework by which we divide the world, it, is socially constructed. And eventually, you even realize that like the differentiation between species is blurry and the differentiation between, you know, they're, they're constantly changing what, you know, kingdom and phylum and, and whatever those categorizations shift because it's not as neat of a tree as is presented. Um, and that is not to say that we shouldn't 
make classifications to divide the world up, but it's to say that those are our projections onto people or onto um, species. You know, and you look at a forest and you can say that tree is its own life form, but is it? You know, at what point is it the same life form as all of these things it's interdependent with? And to what degree are we as individuals our own people? And and that is the kind of reality that I believe we socially construct. So <laughs> to get to the <laughs> metaphor of the ice flow, sorry. No, you're um, good. Is basically I imagine that we're all standing on an ice flow that is our reality. And the places where the ice is thickest is where people have reinforced the ideas. And the places where ice is thinner is where you have fringe cultures and you have ideas that are not as commonly accepted. And a role as an artist is to figure out which parts of reality to reinforce. You know, if you make a cop propaganda show, you're putting the ice under a fairly thick part of the ice flow of reality. Um, whereas if you are an anarchist and express anarchist ideas, it's a much thinner part of that ice flow, but it's not a completely separate ice flow necessarily. It's not a completely separate reality. Um, there's just, it's different places on this reality. And the reason I, I use an ice flow instead of like a raft or something is that I believe that there's also the sea of possibility that surrounds us. And some artists will reinforce existing ideas. And I think that's really worth doing if those ideas are worth reinforcing, even mainstream ideas, often worth reinforcing. And some people will kind of reinforce fringe ideas, and then other people will essentially dive into the ocean and find new ideas. And they'll either come back and add new ice and extend the, the ice flow, or they won't. And maybe they'll be happy out on their own little ice flow separate and maybe they won't be. Um, but I, I, I use, so this ice flow is essentially the majoritarian reality and other people use these terms and I, 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 I should do more research in how other people use these terms. But I used to believe that we had this sort of consensus reality that everyone more or less understands how the world works and what is and isn't real and there's kind of exceptions who are a little bit outside of that through neurodivergence or very different experiences. But overall, we've created one concept. And now I use the word majoritarian reality because I realize instead that there's a, a social pressure to force people to conform to the majoritarian versions of reality and that a lot of tension comes from when people express fundamental differences in, in reality. I think a huge part of the right versus left fight right now, I mean, us trans people are at the center of it, whether we want to be or not. I certainly don't want to be. I'd rather be at the center of it for anarchism than for transness. But whether or not I exist as a trans woman, I don't fit within one version of reality and I do fit within a different version of reality. And so the people who don't believe that I'm a woman want me to fit within what they believe is a majority of what constitutes reality, which is that there's only, you know, there's pee pees and vaginas or whatever. And, um, <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's funny because science, um, tells us that that's not true. Uh, both social science and biological science, right. you know, right. But it, they have a constituted framework that they have fit their entire worldview. And, you know, maybe instead of reality, you could say worldview. I don't, I don't have a, a strong attachment to what word people use. Um, I mean, partly because I, I think that we should be more flexible in our, our worldview should accept more differing worldviews in general but maybe not the ones that don't want people to exist because they, Oh, well, this is always the catch of pluralism. This ties back into it. If the, the anarchists in Ukraine who formed an anarchist society during the Russian revolution gave free speech to the Bolsheviks and the Bolsheviks were able to have their newspapers and things like that. And then the Bolsheviks 
invaded them, even though they were ostensibly military allies against, you know, because the revolution was still ongoing. And, and the Bolsheviks are not pluralist, and they do not allow anarchists to continue to exist. And so there's always this tension between, as someone who is politically pluralist, I don't want everyone to be an anarchist. I just want everyone to let me be an anarchist. And right. in terms of majoritarian reality, I don't need people to share my conception of gender. I just need people to let me have my conception of gender and let me and mine do what we want to do. So that's majoritarian reality is, is this attempt to force people into a singular conception of what constitutes reality. And I hope you don't mind if I ask about gender a bit more, because this majoritarian um, conception of gender and gender roles is something that does come up, uh, what we would call the left. Um, There are people um, who have a very rigid idea of what that should be, and... um, they they basically want to impose this idea on others and they basically are also saying that transness being trans is a threat to women and their autonomy their bodily space their you know there's there's all these arguments and they're 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 kind of tropes or or clichés at this point but they're very harmful um and i'm curious about your thoughts on that because it it's such a charged topic and I have to admit, I don't think this is necessarily a good thing on my part, but I've avoided this topic <laughs> on my podcast, but uh, more and more I'm realizing that's actually irresponsible of me to do that. And I don't want to treat you as somebody like, oh, I, I'm going to talk to Margaret, who is a trans woman, and but I feel like because you have this very personal and political experience with this, I mean, this is a this is a personal thing for you, this, this is v- directly affects your ability to live in the world to do your work um so i i just with all due respect if you were willing to discuss that um yeah, of course. yeah i would I really appreciate that yeah i think about i remember before i came out as trans it was I, I came out in my 30s because i've internalized a lot of those arguments i was a an ardent feminist boy in mm-hmm. the 90s you know mm-hmm. all my friends were lesbians um, sometimes I dated lesbians and they were very confused. I was confused too. And, and it wasn't because I was like trying to get the lesbians to date me. You know, it just was literally whether we had the framework for it or not, people have always on some level kind of known about me even when I didn't. But I, I think about this moment it was at some point when all of this was starting to get talked about a lot, maybe 2015 or 16 or something like that. And I'm standing in a target in Northwest Ohio in some conservative small town. And I'm standing in the hairbrush aisle and I'm staring at these hairbrushes and I can't figure out what hairbrush I need. And you know, this like random normal cis woman walks up and it's like, oh, honey, you need, I think you need this hairbrush. And like, it just did the femme solidarity thing. Mm-hmm. Any, and I don't pass. I still don't pass. I especially didn't pass then. Um, without any hesitation, without any, like, who's this queer or like, you know, and, and I, I think until anti-trans feminism stated its agenda, people have largely accepted a more fluid understanding of gender, even even in a feminist circles. I remember reading, there's a heartbreaking long essay by a this woman who's a sound engineer, who is a trans woman in I think the late 60s. I mean, she's still a trans woman, but she was one in the late 60s. And, you know, and she was part of this like radical feminist separatist group that was very second wave and everyone was just fine and accepting of her until some specific books 
some sp- I don't remember the names of them off the top of my head got published that basically said like kick out all of these men in dresses and you know I mean I, I grew up being one of the girls in a lot of ways like I I didn't identify as a girl I wished I was a girl but I didn't think I was a girl and I sat in the corner of gym class painting my nails with the other girls and I think that people tend not to have a problem with trans people until someone tells them to have a problem with trans people. And then, yeah, you can reframe reality to claim that we're all, you know, trying to force people to fuck us or whatever the hell. And like, I've, I've, I don't know, whatever. I mean, you know, I've never had a specific problem with like people People who are attracted to me make it clear they're attracted to me. I don't need to make people who aren't attracted to me attracted to me. And yeah, I don't know. I I get frustrated by it because it shouldn't be what we have. It shouldn't be a fight that I have to be fighting right now. And it's also hard because, I mean, yeah, a lot of trans people are coming out right now. And I think that's for two reasons. I think that a lot of trans people are coming out right now because there's more representation of us and there's like more of us. So it feels safer. Uh, And that was a large part of it for me is that I I didn't, I wasn't one of the first people in my friend circles to come out, you know, by any, any stretch. I, I actually only finally came out when um, my friend Farrell died in the ghost ship fire in, uh, in Oakland. And she we weren't close but we like kind of saw each other in kind of similar ways gender wise and and i just had this realization that like she died doing something that i do which is play you know electronic music in overcrowded diy spaces and and what if i died and i died and everyone thought i was a man and 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 that that really kind of pushed me. But the other thing that happened that got me to come out is that the circle of what constitutes transness expanded. Because I don't, oh, I'm exactly the kind of person that anti-trans feminists hate. Um, I don't actually have particularly intense like body dysmorphia. Um, I don't take hormones. I have no interest in surgically transitioning besides... Uh, I was getting laser hair removal on my face until uh, COVID knocked mm-hmm. that. I'm mm-hmm. sure mm-hmm. I'm frustrated by that, but I, I didn't need to change my body. And maybe if I was younger, I would, I would have, you know, maybe it's like a little bit of a, like, well, I've gotten used to this body. I'm in my, you know, now I'm in my late thirties, but what was presented to me as trans when I was younger didn't seem to include me. And yet people of all types of transness have always existed also. And like the more I read about queer history, the more I see myself. And there was like uh, different differentiations between, you know, and I'm not using these words like now and I'm only using them to describe my myself as seen through history. I'm not trying to say that people should use these words, but, um, you know, transvestism, uh, transvestitism or whatever the fuck. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm you know, of like men who like dressing as women, right? Somewhere between there and trans woman, you might find me because I'm not trying to change my body, but I'm also not, a lot of people who would identify specifically as cross-dressers, for example, are, um, are men who enjoy wearing women's clothes and that's great. And it gets, one of the reasons that it frustrates me too is that I, I, any social categorization is always flawed and people who see them as binaries, especially, but even as rigid categories, are are entirely missing the point. Any label should not be about constraining us, or any label should just be like the best way to describe something. Like the best way to describe my gender is trans woman, but I don't fit neatly into the trans woman box. And um, and I don't think anyone fits neatly. And maybe some people are sort of the archetypical version of their gender, and in some ways that makes them abnormal, and that's cool. You know, I have no. <laughs> I, gender the way it's constructed by the right wing and by anti-trans feminism which i consider to be a right-wing position at this point um 
does no one any good and hurts women, uh, trans and cis. It is incredibly harmful to trans masculine people. It's incredibly harmful to non-binary people um, of both AMAB and AFAB, you know, sexual designations or whatever. Um, it's also, it's harmful to cis men. Gender, gender norms are harmful to cis men. It, it, it does no one any good. And the things, I try not to be like, a like, won't someone think of the cis men? But there's still something to the fact that like all of the boxes that cis men are kept in make them bad feminists. Um, if men can't talk to men about their emotions, they're going to put it, especially straight men, they're going to put it all on their girlfriends yeah. because they, they don't have any friends who are women except their partners and they can't talk about anything. And, and that's part of what feeds into how men treat women as free therapists I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I, I'm like, I'm no, I'm really relating with what you're saying because I, I am a cis, uh, mm-hmm. cis man. Um, you know, I, I am like the epitome of a privilege in the global north, right, or or anywhere mm-hmm. in the world, really. I'm, I'm a white male. I've been fairly comfortable with my masculinity or how I express my gender. You know, I haven't had to deal with any of this, this internal struggle. I, mm-hmm. you know, what I mean. But, but what's come up more recently is. With me specifically, if I could just speak to this, is that, um, yeah, you're you're speaking to how patriar- patriarchy and these values they they're harmful to everybody, even those that are privileged or entitled under this yeah. arrangement. And I think that's actually one of the really strong one of the very strong points that feminism points to is that it's harmful to everybody. And yeah. I've become, I mean, I've known this in some way my whole life, but growing up and and especially in you know I'm in my early 30s and I'm realizing how my conception of gender and and um, how I've internalized so many of these things and it's really been harmful to my relationships and to myself. Yeah. Um, and so these boxes that we put ourselves in or that we are put in from a very young age are um, are just really destructive. And it causes this almost like a mute. It's a mutilation that occurs. Yeah. And because any part of you that sticks out of the box gets cut off. Is that yeah. Kind of what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. a great way to put it. And and um, I'm also realizing that you know when uh, when we begin to really grapple with these things internally, um, however that comes about in a person's life there can be a lot of a, sh- a lot of shame and guilt attached to it but i've i've um i'm coming to recognize that that's not a useful way to approach any of this either mm-hmm. you know cuz there's this other aspect of almost a dualistic or or binary view um i think that comes from religion which is either you're good or you're bad you know there's yeah. the, you know what i mean so there's like it's a lot of shit to unpack and everybody has to be a part of this project of unpacking these things. Cause I think there's a lot of trauma built into it. Um, and to speak to your metaphor of the ice flow, um, I don't know how, I don't know how we can get there, but we all have to understand that we're all, we're all trying to dismantle something that has been running deep for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Yeah. You know, and there has to be this solidarity in that reality and that fact that we're trying to upend something that runs really deep and we've all internalized um, in our own way. And, and I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think there can be a lot of love that can come out of that recognition. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. We need to build places for us all to stand so that we can, bring blow torches to the part of the ice flow that contains all the patriarchy, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a pacifist by any, any stretch, but I think that pacifism has made a lot of really good arguments about the nature of power and the, the ramifications of violence. And yeah, I, I want, you know, patriarchy is my enemy, not masculinity, not men, specifically. And, and I think, I mean, I think feminism has made that pretty clear as for a long time. And, and, you know, the, 
the sorts of cis men who think that feminism is anti-man. I, I don't have a lot of patience for. Uh, some of the people <laughs> around have have some good patience for it. My bandmate in feminist school is this brilliant feminist, and she has this tolerance for talking men through what we mean with feminism um, that I, I really, uh, well, I don't envy her. I just appreciate in her, you know, um, she can be the good feminist and I can be the bad feminist, but, <laughs> but at the end of the day, yeah, I want a place for everyone to come stand so that we can destroy this really destructive foundation and, and get everyone out or, you know, whatever the metaphors can all get split up, but get everyone out of the building before we blow it up, except for the people who are going to defend the building of patriarchy to the death. And then I don't know, well, let them, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah. I really like the metaphor of the ice flow in describing this. We can look at a lot of our societies or culture through this lens of what parts of this culture do we want to reinforce and what parts do we want to diminish and see disappear ultimately. I, I really wonder on the other end of this, if we reach this sort of truly liberatory moment or, or uh, a place where we have overcome some of the worst aspects of colonization, you know, what would masculinity look like? What would femininity look like? What would gender look like in that context at that time? And I think whatever seeds of that are within us are beginning to grow. I, I think that that is happening right now. And I think it's coming about in a very maybe chaotic or disparate or even confused way. I mean, it can certainly come about in that way. And there's always going to be reactions to that. There's always going to be discussing these sort of cultural somas, these cultural bodies that live through us, they will try to survive and continue to exist. So when we talk about patriarchy or the dominator culture, that wants to continue to live just like any other thing. And we can choose to not give it life. We can choose to give life to other forms that are more inclusive, that uh, attempt to deconstruct and do away with some of the most harmful, traumatic, and abusive elements of our cultural lived experiences. We can choose to do that. And it's a part of doing internal work. And it's not isolated to that. This is community work. This is building community. This is building deeper trusting relationships with ourselves and with others. It's about finding other people to do that work with. That is what's required, I think, now more than ever, especially in the wake of all of the crises that are emerging out of this calamity that began to occur, whether it was several hundred years ago or, or thousands of years ago. You know, we're living in the wake of that. And we have to decide what to do with the time that we have here, how we choose to live and be in relationship with others and ourselves and with the living planet. And I think being in touch with these aspects of ourselves, whether we are talking about gender or other forms of identity, other forms of individual expression, I think that that plays a key role in that. I can't help but see how all of this is interrelated and how once you begin to pull at the thread of gender or trauma or the kind of framework that animism or cultural somatics or, or whatever it is can provide, that once you start pulling on those threads, it, it's all connected. And so I would really like to conclude part six with an interview that I had done with Ian McKenzie. And I had Ian on the podcast three times. I actually did this interview. This was the last interview I did before I started doing this episode 300 series. Ian is a visionary filmmaker, storyteller, and the host of the Mythic Masculine podcast. And he returned to the podcast to discuss mythology, manhood, and emerging masculinities in the wake of calamity. I wrote here that this conversation runs deep. Ian and I attempt to navigate the complexities and shadows of men's work in our time of emerging inquiries and contemplation about gender identity and expression. We wholeheartedly acknowledge that as necessary as those discussions around these subjects are, as vital as they may be, we must ask, where do men fit in this? Ian and I are both what can be described as cisgendered and fairly heteronormative in our relationship styles, situated on a spectrum that has traditionally benefited folks such as ourselves in very concrete and obvious ways. That reality is not contested by either of us. But as we expand upon in this discussion, 
the patterns of behavior and the beliefs that accompany men through their lives extremely limit them in their relationships, both with others and with themselves, and their development through the various stages of adulthood. The patterns of domination, manipulation, and violence that characterize so much of how men engage with those around them stem from deep wounds that must be looked at and addressed. Ian and I delve into these subjects honestly, and I ask Ian to express what he has learned on his path exploring these subjects with his work in film and the Mythic Masculine podcast. Yeah, I mean, really, this, I felt, was the best way to really conclude this part six this conversation is really important to me to have conversations around what it means to be a man and whether that even is a important category to have to define yourself as such. And I think Ian and I agree on certain aspects of this subject. And so recognizing how this question emerges in the wake of the calamity of colonization is really crucial and key here. And I think it really fits into the broader themes that I've tried to explore throughout this part six. I think what we talked about maybe before, we talked a little bit about this before we started recording, which is that we can talk about it in a general, a generalizing sense. Um, but this is a personal thing too, because we're both men. And uh, I, I think I may have said this as well, that for me, my coming to terms with maybe how I, who I am and that I am a man um, is in it within a context of a time in which questions around gender and gender expression is like a really big thing. And I think it's absolutely necessary to have those conversations. So, you know, I I think also like whether you're born, let's say you're born queer or you're born trans and you have these, um, this trying to live in a society such as ours is very difficult. So coming to terms with that is a whole process. But I also think if you're heteronormative or cisgender, there's also a process of coming to terms with what that means for you as well. It may not be as rife with like threats of violence, of course, or any of those types of things that uh, people who are who are not cisgendered or heteronormative would experience. But there is this like real sense of like, you know, I have to be a certain way and there's a certain category or box that I have to fit into. And uh, my own personal experiences with coming to terms with masculinity or my own masculinity or or manhood or whatever has been like that, like feeling that I've had an aversion towards it and not really taking responsibility for it. Because to me, I've associated men most of my life as being what we would call, you know, the bad story of toxic masculinity. Like I have not seen very many good examples in my life of like what it means to be a man in the most embodied, fullest sense of that. And so I wonder how much of this work you do exploring masculinity and what it means to be a man in that sense is tied to your maybe quest to figure that out for yourself. Like, um, you know, with all of these questions around, you know, what is, what is gender and how is gender expressed in all of these subjects? I think that needs to be directed towards men in a certain way, because like we're here we're not going to go away and we're, we need to have these like kind of conversations as well. I don't know if these make questions make any sense in yeah. any comprehensive way. Cause it's kind of, <laughs> I think I mentioned before we started, I'm in a pretty like weird emotional place at this exact moment. But anyway, I, these are a lot of thoughts I've been having and I'm trying to sure. spill them onto you and hope may, hopefully they make some kind of sense to you. So I guess in your own personal journey, how has this like project of yours helped you like come to terms with some of these mm-hmm. questions or subjects I sort of, threw at you there yeah 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 you know i'm i'm thinking now of a conversation i had with a a author um i think he's a professor as well in san francisco his name is alan chinnan and he wrote a book called beyond the hero which came out after iron john uh, a Mm -hmm. few years after uh bly i believe robert bly wrote iron john or he wrote the book iron john um he, he he supported with the manuscript there as well so in some ways it was like a lineage continuity from from Iron John, which those who read the book know that it is largely a, a story about initiation from boy to manhood, uh, and when was sort of foundational in the the text that kicked off the first wave mythopoetic men's movement, and of course another major one was um, King War Magician Lover. Uh, so Beyond the Hero, which is very a lot less known, and I, I somebody recommended it. I think a listener I posted it, and I 
I found it and I was like, wow, this is really incredible. Because what it does is it looks at the journey after. So from more like midlife of, of sort of masculine stories. And one thing he talks about there as well is this uh, sequence that men actually go through um, or seem to seem to go through, which is um, this, they start uh, sort of as boys and, and there's a sort of adolescent masculinity, right? Like um, if we're talking uh, again, our culture, and this is, again, as soon as you talk about masculinity or femininity or masculine feminine, I mean, I should say all of this just before I get to the beyond the hero, all of, all of this inquiry is happening in the wake of something that has already happened. <laughs> and maybe that's one way to say it. Right. And, and that happening is, is like Stephen Jenkinson would say, and, you know, it's like, uh, uh, putting up your tent, you know, in the, in a valley, um, not realizing that it's actually a crater. Mm, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's, I feel what all, so much of this conversations are actually about. They're actually happening in a crater of something that's already happened. And what's the happening, you know, that I've also been able to tra- track, I mean, more broadly, just say the, just the utter wake of, I mean, colonization, calamity, displacement, mm-hmm. right? And essentially like a, a total uh, tribal breakdown. And, and when I say tribal in this case, I mean, not how it's used often in modern day context is a kind of tribalism, right? Which is a sort of uh, only adhering to a certain identity group, I think. Mm-hmm. Whereas I mean tribe in the sense of like distinct peoples. And, you know, I, conversations I have with indigenous folk who still have connection and lived reality with their intact lineages you know they often just say well this is you know this is what our people do you know about whatever we happen to be talking about well this is what our people do uh they rarely seem to say to me you know everyone should do this right Mm -hmm. everyone should be doing what we do because there's a particular kind of humility but also a knowing who they are i think that comes with when one understands oneself to be part of a discernible people and connected to a place and so that's what I'm trying to say is like, you know, we're kind of in the wake of uh, a sort of the, the suffering and the uh, pain of, of living under some kind of universal, right? Mm-hmm. Which one could say that the, the sort of distinct binary that um, those who grew up in modern culture are sort of forced into, and, and often the term comes out of uh, that this is patriarchy, like a sort of distinct and, and enforced binary of, you know, these types of behaviors are okay for men, these ones aren't, right. and for women it's this. And of course, queer and non-binary have a very hard time because they don't fit in that picture. They're, they're actually sort of erased from that picture, sometimes, you know, or often by force. Yeah. And so if that's, that's, the, that's the crater, I guess I'm trying to say. So what, what is helpful to know, I think, is that the, the natural response to a, a sort of, um, I don't know, violent, suppressive universal can be often to try to create another universal, hmm. right? Which, which makes sense because it's like, oh, well, this isn't working, this universal. So we need a different universal that is more inclusive. Uh, that is, you know, and it, what it sounds like, I think often is, you know, you, you can be whatever you want to be, right? Like if that's the triumph often is like, well, you can just, you know, there was some video I saw a little while ago by, I think it was uh, a young person who was, I think, coming out as non-binary. Um, and they, their sort of triumphal statement was sort of, you can decide who, whoever you want to be. Uh, and in some ways, it does sound like a victory, you know, to the in the face of a system that would tell you to be a certain way, right? And yet, there's something else, I think, there below, which is almost like it's still a triumph of this individual uh, sense of oneself as supreme, right? Yeah. Which, uh, when you talk to other, again, peoples that have a certain deeper uh, communal collective uh, understanding of the world and an interdependent understanding of the world, you know, they don't necessarily consider the supremacy of the self as some kind of triumph, right? They actually see that that's, there's a deep loss there when you don't see yourself as a deeply relational being who actually relies on the feedback of others, like the loving feedback and you know, the, the mentors and the elders to track you and to like name your medicine and, you know, all that kind of stuff I feel gets lost when, you know, the victory is I decide who I am and, you know, you know anybody else doesn't matter. Um, so I just, I'll say that to then get back to now to beyond the <laughs> sure. hero. Yeah. So what he talks about is then that men have this journey that they seem to take, which is that they start with, you know, as an adolescent, uh, sort of adolescent masculinity. And then they have this, uh, he calls it the fear and fascination of the feminine, right? Which I love that phrasing, the fear and the fascination. 
because again, it's this like, oh, it's not me. It's this other, this mysterious other. And of course, when puberty kicks in and often if there is this uh, heterosexual orientation, of course, then there is this mysterious draw mm-hmm. and, and attraction. And then also, yeah, this fascination and this fear. And he says it's really important as this then uh, exploration into the feminine, which for me, when I track on my story, I think that's absolutely true, right? Like I, uh, this whole journey I, I spent for about four, well, maybe six years, I think total, uh, exploring Amplify Her, right? Which is the project that ended up being really a, a look at the rise of the feminine uh, through the lives of artists, DJs and producers, female DJs and producers, um, of which I was a co-director on the project. And for me, that was also my immersion into feminine archetypes and, you know, reading Marion Woodman, women who dance with uh, women who run with wolves, um, dancing in the flames, looking at a lot of gender theory and all this. That does not make me an expert at all. It just means that, yeah, I I tried to really understand as much as I could. Um, And from that experience, I then revealed the depth of what I didn't know about masculinity. And then that became my journey into, oh, I found Iron John, my grandfather's study quite auspiciously and uh, launched, you know, in, into my own sort of like, oh, wow, why hadn't I looked at this before? Right. Which, again, is part of that veil of, uh, of la- like being unable to really see oneself from that lens that has permeated the culture. And, you know, less so now, depending on who you talk to, that you know, this kind of mythic lens has been uh, reignited. Right. So it feels uh, more accessible, I think, for men now. Uh, particularly, you know, when they're ready, Bly says usually around 30, 35 is when they kind of have a, you know, their, their best intent, you know, in their twenties onward seems to have turned to ash and, you know, and they, they ask questions then again of like, whoa, who am I actually, you know, and you know, what is authentic and all that stuff. And so, you know, there's a certain mysterious timing to things. So I'll just say that, yeah, that this fascination and fear of the feminine. And then on the other side of that, I'll just end with this. He just says, then there's this uh, inquiry or contact made what's what he calls the deep masculine, which is again, a whole other territory, which is really great to go down if you want to get there, but maybe I'll just pause and, uh, yeah, see what you think. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I, I just want to say like the, this progression you're talking about, I, I just resonated with it because what I thought I knew in my twenties is just totally fucking disintegrated <laughs> to the point where, it's really it's 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 upsetting it's been an upsetting thing because it's it's like it's like learning that everything i thought i knew about myself isn't really as solid as i thought it was Mm -hmm. and um there's just a lot of threads there that i almost want to follow i'm trying to think of where to go with this right now Mm. um bly calls that the road of ashes by the way okay the the descent to ashes yeah which is that Kitchen work, okay. he calls it, when you when you're based, sifting through the ashes of you know your good intentions and ideas of yourself, but as necessary work. Yeah, there's and there is that thing, and I and I had to, a certain aspect of growing up or a certain maturity, which is good intentions are fine, but like that doesn't change your behavior, the behaviors of your past or your present, and how that's impacted people you care about, and how that's affected relationships. Mm. And there's like a real like real hard thing there it's a really deep pain and that's the thing i've been like grappling with over the past few years is this like not sure where to go or how to proceed anymore with this because it's really easy to see all the things wrong with men today i see it everywhere i go i see it in myself and um it feels like there's just a giant hole there Mm. this like void that never got attended to or acknowledged for so long and now i'm in my 30s i'm 32 right now and it's like anyone who's gotten close enough to me has seen that void and (laughs) then they don't know what to do with that and i don't know what to do with it either so it's like and i know that that's tied to being a man in some way i know it has something to do with that and so this place I'm in currently is, is acknowledgement of that. And so this whole journey of, of men, so to speak, it seems to be tied to that. And it's like health, a real culture, healthy culture seems to acknowledge that thing that boys or men need 
in order to grapple with that thing inside of them. That just seems to be what it feels to me. And I'm like, and this is the fear I have, this like horrifying fear, which is that, is it too late? Like, is it too late for me? Is it too late for others? Mm. What do I do with this thing? I mean, is it just going to eat everything up that I care about, you know, and the thing that I want the most, you know, will I never attain that thing, you know? So it's, it's this, this journey you're talking about is really like connecting with me. I just, I don't know if you've related with that feeling at all. Could you describe um, it a little more too? Like you said, this void and now do you mean like a sort of uh, existential angst or, or sort of a blanket of depression or, you know, is there yeah, to sure. It's it? kind of all of those things. Sometimes it's a, um, it can come at, it's, it's a, uh, I think it's honestly, it's a, there's a bit of a trauma there. So a lacking of something in my childhood. It's not about blame. I'm not, I'm past the point of blaming anybody for this. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of like lacking something, not having men in my life, for instance. Like I've had a lot of nurturing women. That's been no issue. I've had a lot of nurturing women and beautiful human beings, not just nurturing women, other nurturing men too, but just nurturing people. Mm. But then the, the other side of that has been wholly lacking I think in many cases I've seen more than anything disappointment from men. They've fallen short in like every way that's meaningful, except in like, Oh, I can pay for things or I can like take care of like material needs and that's Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that spawned this like complex and it's led to this confused confusion about my relationship with myself and my own gender and my own expression of masculinity or, or being a man. And then also my confusion around, how to be in like intimate relationship with people. Like that's the whole, the whole is like, I will never have enough because I can't get, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it any other way. And it manifests in all kinds of dysfunctional behaviors, um, addictive patterns and so on, Mm. which I'm currently trying to like, like deal with Mm -hmm. personally speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that answer it at all? Oh, yeah, I think so, so. You know, I mean, it can it can manifest as depression for sure. Just yeah. a blanket of like, I don't know what to do anymore with my life, and I don't know if there's any point of going on. Like that's the worst end of it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I I mean, what comes to me is just a. I mean, uh, I think what Martin Schaffer said this, but he was I think he was quoting Rumi, but he said, uh, you know, when you haven't become when you haven't been fed, become bread. Hmm. And there's something in that with, like you said, like how do you turn what you never got into something right and and in that sense there's the invitation there which is which is formidable you know to to traverse the gap of which properly in a, and by that sort of birthright would have come to you the presence of men in your life in that certain way those that would have gathered you in at a certain age generally around 13 14 right taking you out to the wild or somewhere where you can have an encounter with the great mystery um which you know, I'm in, I'm currently in a four year cycle of which I'm in the last one. And so I have some time in with this. And again, it doesn't make me an expert at all. It just means like I have a little bit of experiential um, sense of what that is to be essentially like properly and, and sort of compassionately, but firmly uh, brought to the, the end of you. Mm. Right. And in some sense, it is a kind of trauma. It certainly would be probably to that age, like 13, 14. Whereas later in life, when people participate in these things like wilderness vigils and things, you know, you can certainly go through a lot. Um, but it, it it doesn't have perhaps generally that same sense of utter world endingness um, that, that perhaps a youth would have, right? When, when, be, when they really are like, what is happening? I don't, you know, I, yeah. I can't put this together. So it's, it is in some sense, it's like meaningful trauma mm. uh, in, in that it's something that is traumatizing to basically be brought to the edge of you. Um, but in a village context where people properly would have helped you make meaning of that, right. And would have said, this is what it's, you know, inviting you into a bigger story that you're not the center of the universe. And yeah. thank goodness you're not the center of the universe actually. Right. That, yeah, that, right. You, but you're part of it. You're part of that story. And then you would have been welcomed in likely into some, you know, way of, of meaningful service to both the, you know, the community and to life itself. And so in some sense, like, you know, you're, I think you're speaking truly, you're you're testifying to this existential void, 
which is the it is intelligent and then it points to something that's not there right and so like you said i mean yeah there's a lot of ways in which the the coping strategies kick in and yeah certainly for me too oftentimes it's like busyness it's like stay busy right for a lot of people that is that's another way of of kind of keeping it you know at bay um and i have to say that yeah there's no way around it in the sense that you actually have to go into it i i think and but i'm drawing from other modalities like um you know, Stephen Jenkinson said too one time that uh, depression is what happens when grief isn't allowed in the room, hmm. right? That that actually depression, uh, and actually drawing from another uh, fellow I interviewed, uh, Clinton Callahan, he talks about depression as the mix of uh, anger and sadness. That actually those two, and it's almost like the they're stuck both trying to get out the door at the same time. And so in that mixing, they, they become almost this uh, debilitating, uh, yeah. f- emotion or a debilitating force, right? Whereas, like Clinton, he advocates for demixing emotions, where he's like, act physically, you know, kind of do this, like, uh, uh, and like <laughs> pull them apart, and then you can go fully into the anger, right? Hopefully, and there's like practices that he offers, and then you can go fully into the sadness, and then mm-hmm. like it moves, and they're not like stuck in the doorway still. So, yeah, I guess I, I want to depathologize a little bit. I think of what you're speaking to because. I mean, it's, it's true in that, like, yeah, there's a lot that wasn't there that should have been. There's a lot of grief in that and a lot of anger in that, that it wasn't the case. And that on the other side of that, hopefully is this willingness to say, okay, well, if I didn't get it, what's needed to plant the seeds for the generations to come. All right, everybody, that is the end. That is the end of part six. I have one more part that I'm going to be releasing here, part seven, uh, which will be dealing with grief and transition and endings. I feel like it's a fitting end to the series, but I just really want to thank you all if you made it all the way through this series up to this point, if you made it all the way through this part six, uh, thank you for your attention. I really hope that this has been a good experience for you. I throw these things out there. This has been a project that has been consuming me for a few months like I've said so many times before, it's been beneficial for me to go through these previous interviews that I've conducted and work with them again. And this has been a way for me to do that in a somewhat creative fashion. But like I always do, I will end this by asking you to please support my work in any way that you can. To learn more about this podcast and to listen to the previous parts to the series, you can go to my website, lastbornthewilderness.com. Everything you need to know will be there. If you would like to support this work monetarily, you can do that through two means. The first is through a one-time donation through PayPal. You can go to paypal.me slash lastbornpodcast. You can throw a few dollars my way there, or you can throw some money at me through Venmo. You can find me at lastbornpodcast. If you would like to support this work on a monthly or yearly basis, you can do that through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash lastborninthewilderness. You can support my work for however much you would like to, uh, $1 or more a month, you'll gain early access to these interviews before I release them publicly. You will also gain access to some other exclusive content there as well. And that is it, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to part six. And I'll have one more and then we will conclude the series. Have a good one.